Hey everybody, welcome to Wing Talk. I'm Steve, and today, once again, I'm joined with my partner in crime, Mr. Mark Hoffman. Mark, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing great, thank you. And then we also have, of course, as always, our beloved Darren Lines coming to us live from the UK. Darren, what's up, babes? Yeah, no, I'm having a good day. I've had a good weekend, destroying a few planes, so yeah, it's all brilliant. All right. Before I forget, I want to make sure we wish everybody a happy Father's Day because I know there's a lot of fathers out there. So happy Father's Day. I'm one. I'm with you. And um, to commemorate Father's Day, we're going to have a uh, show today where we absolutely cannot have your children around to listen to it. So if you're in the car, what you're to say. <laughs> You've been warned. That's all I can say. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, or I should just say gentlemen and a couple ladies, um, it's my privilege. If you are in this hobby for more than 20 minutes, you'll know that you'll find yourself on YouTube trying to check out what's going on with all the different planes and what the who to review and what to talk about and all that good stuff. And then there's always this one guy comes across, he starts off by saying, howdy, I'm Matt. And that is, you know him and you're like, who is this guy? I can't believe I'm watching him. He's absolutely bizarre. I love this guy. And all of a sudden you find you're like yourself waiting for his next review. So he's a voice. He's a very good voice in our industry. He went away for a while and now he's back. And we're really excited to have him. And so it's my pleasure. I mean, it really is a pleasure to have Mr. Matt Ogborn coming to us. Matt. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I do appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand you gents have got a couple of questions for me, for me this evening. Um, I, I do want to actually just, can I, can I just start like from the very beginning and sure. just say from the off, like in the last couple of, I'm going to say within the last two weeks, I have really been blown away by the humbling, is the right word, comments which I've received both on YouTube or direct messages and a couple of other locations as well um, from people who have been really um, excited to see me back creating content. I, I, I've just genuinely been blown away and that is the right word, just blown away by such nice comments which have come in um, from just randomly creating a video to to, to us being a couple of days in, a couple of weeks later on now. So yeah, I, need, I just needed to get that out there. Thank you, is what I'm just trying to basically say. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're absolutely beloved in this industry. And you know, it's like one of the things like we've had, we've lost a couple of really good voices over the last few years. Um, we had the Blue Falcon and also Sam Shepard. I, so, I was gonna say Sam Shepard, that was actually, that, that was a motorbike accident, wasn't it? Both of them were actually. Yeah, that was, um, was right. so cool. So when people go away with strong voices, it's like we feel it. And so, you know, and it's like one of the things. We're like, we are your fans. So, you know, it's like we tune in and we enjoy you. And it's just kind of, you bring a different element to the RC community. And that's absolutely why it's great to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was on purpose, but that's also part of personality as well, isn't it? That does kind of come through too. That, I think we've all got it, that 12 and three, quarter, three quarters are old, which just comes out in all of us. That, it's just that moment, it's like you just, the whole world just behind you just fades away and you're that little child again going, I'm gonna kill that tree. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, such good times. I, I, yeah, I think we've all got that within us. And um, so yeah, maybe we should sure. start by asking you. I mean, I did a little research. You're actually a software engineer. Uh, actually, you told me that. So I did not. But I mean, there's a background to you. And all we see is this guy, the you know, the grown up child. There must have been a child child at one point. <laughs> there, there was indeed. So um, yeah, let me just give you a little bit of background. So this is just me. I'm. I'm what you see on me, what you see of me on YouTube is a, how do you explain this? It is a very specific persona, um, but it's also me. So that for some of you which have been around from like the very beginning will know the be humble, never lie and be me, like the three pillars of everything which I do 
on YouTube because th those are you can't go wrong with those kind of like guiding factors and probably why I've annoyed a few people along the way um, because they go the certain things go against those three things is that be humble when you need to be that's for sure especially when you're wrong and again that's one of the things I feel really nice about this hobby as well which is that it's, it's more like you, you have opinion but it's also like science as in that it's okay to be wrong, isn't it? You, you can screw up, you can be wrong, you can say one thing one day and then come back a week later and go, actually, kind of screwed up. It's not that at all. Um, so yeah, sorry, to answer your question, yeah, the day-to-day -day job, software, um, know and use multiple languages, all e-commerce related. Um, the video editing skills came from a business which we started and unfortunately just wrapped up actually uh, to do with uh, e-commerce education using Magento and uh, a couple of tools to sell online. So my, my background is multi-channel e-commerce, so selling on eBay, on Amazon, your own website, underneath one or multiple entities. Uh, so, for example, if you look at like a company, say, like Tesco's outlet, um, which I launched onto eBay, uh, or if you look at companies like Superdry, you can imagine like some of the, like, the logistical nightmares which they have uh, with stock, return graded stock, and yes, they use third parties and things like that, but it's the software tools which, um, which they use. Uh, I wasn't a de developer, that was more of implementation, but I'd always written PHP and had a keen interest in web-based technologies and so that's what I do on the, I, the software which I create is not that big. I, I just solve people's issues uh, and because of my experience I'm normally not that far away from solving them as well uh, and of course uh, if you if you solve someone's problem they're willing to pay for it. That's that's uh, because convenience always wins and that's why Amazon does so well. They may not make massive percentages on the majority of their products. However, it is extremely convenient to be able to, and thank goodness things are getting back to normal now, that you can literally order a day and have it on your doorstep the next day. The Amazon will outstrip strip eBay because they can do that. They have a distribution network to do that. So yeah, my background is, is e-commerce and, and software. Did you get uh, formally educated in that? You went to university for that? No, I, uh, my, my education is a bit of a laugh. <laughs> uh, what did I get? I got four Bs, one C and two Ds or somewhere in GCSEs. Uh, I, I, I've never known what I wanted to do. And I literally have never known what I wanted to do. I, there, there's a story which I tell, which is about Paul Elford and this was one of my friends growing up in primary school and I'm so jealous of this child and I'm so jealous of anybody who's got it he wanted to be a fireman because his dad was a fireman do you think this bloke moved hell in high water to become a fireman of course he did he knew what he wanted to do so he always had direction so no I didn't have a clue so formally educated uh, I did do a HND in electrical and electronic communications engineering so everything from fiber optics to oh dare I say it radar I hated that one um but that was all by fluke I turned up to do a course on tv and toasters uh and then I just saw some of the buddies from my school and said well what are you doing now well we're doing this I said that sounds way better than what I signed up for so I had a chat with the tutor and within two minutes I'd gone from doing tv and toasters to to, to a HND which was fun first two years did really well got the MD Second year, uh, I discovered alcohol and women, um, and <laughs> it all went downhill from there because we do like six nights a week. <laughs> the good old days. <laughs> so uh, you, I, I don't. So drink. Yeah, that's fantastic <laughs> that you're able to just like uh, to be able to, to take a skill like software and. Hey, that's another thing that you and Darren have in common. Darren has a software background of some type. I think your education is more formal, isn't it, Darren? Uh, almost. I mean, I, I went to college and did uh, IT, but it's that's it's more a generalisation. But um, afterwards, I went to work for um, one of the early online learning companies, so ma mainly web stuff again, so HTML, Java, and then after that, I I learned PHP myself. So yeah, yeah. It's very similar sort of background. 
And then for his day job, Mark does tech support for an American company, Dell, in Germany. So mm. it's like, I guess you're like level two tech support. So it's when the people below can't answer the questions. They yeah. get actually, called actually to you. it's already level three tech support. So I'm the highest oh level gosh. customer can reach uh, on the technical <laughs> side. And I got the, the, the really bad shit. <laughs> <laughs> so there's always seems to be, you know, a, uh, a lot of computer technology that tends to bring people towards INAV and then into this, especially into this hobby. Then again, you know, we look in the group, we actually have people that work at gas stations and things like that. So they have no background in any of this. They just like to fly. Yeah, so. absolutely. Uh, by the way, can I just butt in there for a moment? If there's anyone who's joined us in live or maybe perhaps afterwards and they've got a question for, for any of us, just stick it in the live chat as they're going along. Um, of course, remember, if you're using a mobile phone, it's icon down right at the bottom and you have to click the live chat button. So. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Yeah, the yeah. the chat is already uh, going crazy when we started the live stream. They are all happy that you are back in business now <laughs> for us. So uh, the really great responses there. And yeah, guys, if you have any questions, just put it in the chat. I I monitor that and I will uh, transfer the questions. Or... So I yeah, I try to watch your video. Um, actually, I made it about halfway through the video why you went away and. You long story short is that you want to get in a better physical condition, which is why you, you're covering yourself up right now, so I can't see that gorgeous body of yours. <laughs> it's yeah. got six packs. And no, we're not in six pack stage yet. That actually, the the a six pack is actually made in the kitchen, not in the gym. Um, I, and I don't mind sharing the story with that. Is that it was a culmination of events of just being lazy over a long period of time and. Um, we had it was involved in an earthquake, which was very, very scary um, to the point I couldn't sleep for days afterwards. Of course, you, you, those of you who have been in an earthquake and stayed in that zone for a period of time, you'll know that there are tremors which come before and after. Where were uh, you? This is California? No, this was in Zante uh, over by Greece. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah. And oh. I lived through the 94 earthquake. Yeah, so I know what it's like. It was like, I didn't think I'd be alive in about 10 seconds. It was that bad. How big was this quake? It's not. It's an experience which um, I you don't want to go through. Especially if you, maybe if you're used to them and have experienced yeah. before, it wouldn't be so profound. But that, 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 was, that was a trigger point. So, yeah, I decided um, my, my boobs had shadows. And that, that was not a good thing. <laughs> uh, and literally, I just set a goal of a six pack as being the goal, but not to go, not to cheat and to do things methodically and slowly work for it. And by the way, the, when I say cheat, I mean, don't use things like uh, certain types of supplements. We'll leave it as that. Uh, to do that, that would be a very easy route. So I've gone the, the longer, harder route. Um, I started off with a four kilogram kettlebell. And now I can shuck around two eights at the same time uh, for the best part of an hour. Uh, I, and I genuinely enjoy and I, I, I feel a, a million times better uh, in myself. And I, I tell you what, the, the biggest mark of the um, my, my progress, physically at least, is that A, that I walk down the road and go, I quite like my reflection. And then when you catch somebody the opposite sex checking you out, then you think you've got it right. So that, that I, I am very happy at the moment, but I still have a long way to go with um, those specific goals because it's not a short term. I'm not willing to cheat. So I want to do things correctly and I want this to last for the long term, if that makes sense. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. So it's, it's a bit of a thing. Was there also the question I have when I was watching the video is there was also this thing about if, if you have a creative mind, you kind of end up doing a lot of like when you start something it's like and it starts working and it starts growing it's like you're addicted like you can't sleep at night because you're so excited that everything's working out do, do, do you know what? so in the background is that the other business well, one of the businesses which i run it was education and it's to small to medium-sized business owners and they 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 just got it so what you're saying there is that once you get into a groove of doing something, it, you will use YouTube as the example here, uh, is that it may look hard, it may look daunting, 
uh, and it, it could be fitness, for example, we'll go from creating content to, to, to fitness, for example. But this, the moment you get into the groove and you start going with it, of course, then that it just absorbs your life. Yeah. And you do wake up. I did, the funniest thing, right, is that um, there, there's a new character which I've in, introduced, which I, I've got some more scenes for Sandal Slapper Dave. Um, and when they hit me, I, it could be I'm walking down the street. I could be chatting to the wife. They, 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 they just come at me randomly. And the next second, I am absolutely wetting myself with laughter because <laughs> I, they, they, they just come, the things like that just come to you if you're in the mindset of doing stuff. So with YouTube, that was literally, I was going to do a video a day for a year. And of course, that then went on for three years. Uh, and just going to the next video, next video, next video, from an outsider's perspective, looks really difficult. Actually, from the insider's perspective, the hardest thing is actually keeping track. And, and I've got notes up on my screen here, which I'm also using here in the background. Is keeping track of what you should be doing and when you should be doing it. That's such a challenge. Uh, so, sorry, just to see so what, Mark, we have a question. Yeah, uh, Liam asks, uh, what age did you start coding on or learning all that stuff? I don't know, um, 20, something like that. It would have been really simple, as in that I wanted to do something and just went and learnt it because I wanted something to work a specific way. Um, I do have, um, and it's, it, I was like, so I, I can't remember when it would, but it would have been, I've seen something I want to do and thought to myself, it can't be that hard. Let's just go and do it. So just expanding on from that question, it doesn't matter whether we're, we're talking about software, creating content for YouTube or training, for example, uh, is that if you have the right attitude, which is that it can't be that hard, can it? And screw it, let's go and do it. Uh, then everything is suddenly really easy. So if you've never coded before and you want to write code, freecode.com or free.net, I think it is. Just do it in Google. That you have you've got on YouTube. Um, there, there's no excuses. You just if you want to go and do something, heck, just go and do it. And that that's actually that was in my notes. Really, yeah, we're kind of at this point right now where it's in our society where you can whatever you want to do, you can just go look up on. Uh, a uh, go to a computer and look it up and learn and that's kind of how i think why i think youtube is so important for not only well everything but especially in our hobby because you when we're dealing with people like when we live into the group we find that they're in small cities in really small countries and there's no one within 100 miles of them who flies rc planes and so we're their help I know, and th th there's um, there's a, an author, uh, a very smart guy called Seth Godin, uh, and he wrote a book called Tribes, and that what you're explaining there is exactly what Seth outlines outlines in his book is tribes, people with the same interests just kind of end up together. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, and the internet just accelerated that from. Um, message boards to what is now Facebooks and groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we, it's what's the what's the, uh, dogs? Dogs are the best real life example. So you've got people interested in RC. However, if, if if you've got a dog, you will know this. You're out walking your dog, and a complete stranger will come over and start chatting to you. And, and this is coming from somebody who's never had a dog before and now owns one, Luna. Uh, and I, I was absolutely blown away by that. It's that it's suddenly if, if you've got something in common with somebody, then it's much easier to talk to them. Even a complete stranger, which you've never met in before in your life and may never meet afterwards. Especially if you have a rare breed of dog where, you know, they run into it. It's like, oh, my gosh, you got a Boston Terrier. I got a Boston Terrier. Yeah, I have Boston Terriers and I have people come up. I had these when I was 12 years old and, you know. It's just, it's, I know exactly what you're saying. It is. And I, so I've got miniature schnauzer and I can tell you miniature schnauzer owners are more mental than what I am. This one woman, when Luna was a puppy, she <laughs> drove the wrong way round a roundabout. Then <laughs> on the roundabout, got out of the car, left the door open and came over and said hello and had a cuddle with the dog. I am <laughs> never, and, and that, 
just <laughs> summarises a miniature Schneider owner. They are absolutely mad as cheese, and they are such nice people. And so, yeah. <laughs> That's fabulous. I guess with our hobby, it is kind of like when you think about the number of people who want to fly fly anything like drones there's like oh everyone knows somebody who flies a drone oh yeah they got a dgi drone or something like that my nephew has one an extra neighbor has one but when you talk to people who fly planes there are very few of us and then when you talk about people who want to put a flight controller on a plane we're like one in every 50 miles or so you know yeah they're, 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 they're in a, in a populated that. area although i would say that i just think from my own activities is that again the multi-rotors drones whatever you want to call them is that it they were becoming exceptionally popular but they never they didn't personally interest me that's why we've done i've done very little with them and um but however what i have seen and i'm sure you've seen it i'm sure many people watching this as well may have come from this direction is that they started with multi-rotors really yeah. enjoyed it and then saw these guys have an absolute wicked fun with wings etc etc and they've come across from a multi-rotor environment and INAV specifically has been an absolute god blessing for them because they do get stabilization stabilization they can whack, whack that return to home button and it looks really familiar to them because they've been using well they may have been using clean flight for example uh, back in the day or maybe using beta flight now so the hop from beta flight to INAV is not actually a big hop is it it is you have servo outputs and not four ESCs. It's really straightforward it's, to them. We, I tend to notice that people who come across um, the line, of, you, you got two, you got three types of people. Either people who have never flown anything before and they have the hardest time. Then you got line of sight pilots like myself who came across. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I still remember that, 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 oh, sorry, I, I've completely derailed you. I, um, sorry. That's where the saying landed came from because you were saying people have never started before. And that was, I, I still remember learning to fly myself. And I started off at a proper model airplane flying club, like Sandal Slapper City, you know? And it was so bad. And you, you, you have to, you're supposed to announce that you're landing so that the other <laughs> pilots on the flight line know that your model's coming in. Well, of course, <laughs> If I landed in the nearest postcode, I was happy. Uh, <laughs> and of course, well, the model's already hit the ground, so landed. <laughs> so that, that's where that saying came from, because it was just too late. Um, so sorry, Steve, you, I completely derailed you. You were saying <laughs> you got oh, new people to the hobby. You know, there's actually no agenda here today. I figured uh, the thing when we do these, we there are times when we would have typed up agendas and like, here's the first question, you know, all the questions we'd have for you and everything like that. I want something that's kind of more free flowing and just kind of like yourself. Just be yourself. Let you know when something comes to your mind and you start smiling, just let it out. I don't care. All that right. sounds great. But yeah, we have so line of sight pilots. We have people who have flown quads before, and then we have people who have well, no. Nope, so it's three things: they've flown nothing, they've flown um, pl planes, line of sight, and they've flown quads. And what we find is the people who come across from quads tend to do very well because. They got the whole idea of the flight controller down and how to solder that and that and code it. And that's a big, I think a lot of line of sight pilots have a problem with the whole thing of like soldering for the first time. And Yeah, it, it can be very daunting to, to, to begin with because and the amount of people which I know have snapped off USB connectors off. Like I, I've still not done that yet. I, I it just I don't understand how you would put so much force into it that you know the USB connector on the flight controller to break it off. Uh, I'm sure there might be one out there which had a dodgy, dodgy soldering joint on it and it might have been really weak. But um, that is the, that's the thing that's the summary. To, I think you're right. Is that somebody who's come from a fixed wing background? These flight controllers are really scary, um, and I think it requires all this setup. When actually the multi rotor guys are going to go. Well, actually, this is really easy can it's because i've only got two servo outputs i am four what do you mean i don't have to solder all these escs on they just kind of get it so yeah, yeah. There, there is a difference there and i i think just going back and focusing on line now for a moment i think that's probably why that original inav series because it, it, it did really well 
because I identified that was something which I identified what back in 2017, which was that it could look like it's complicated. All right, what am I good at? Right, I'm good at breaking things down into plain English. Well, heck, let's break this out into a 10 part series and we'll start at one and we'll work out work our, our way all the way through. And it's quite funny, there's people that even today which comment on that that series and the soldering one's always funny because it you, you'll always get that. We'll say um, that that special type of multi rotor pilot, which loves to have ultra clean soldering. That Joshua Bardwell yeah. offspring, who he's, he's been there and got a microscope out on it and stared <laughs> on it, and it's got to be precise. And there's a difference between a dry joint and a oh what? Um, and so that we get the odd comment on that one, which always makes me laugh, um, to say the least. But the, yeah, you're right. That 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 series, think back on originally online have did really well because there was that need to explain to a specific audience. And that, that's one thing which YouTube isn't really good for, is that if you have an idea, especially if it's something which you're struggling with, and then you go and find the answer and then share the answer, that those kind of videos always do the best. I'm And going off topic, that my biggest, most popular video uh, is for a game of World of Tanks I, and, and then I've got multiple other examples which are both on YouTube underneath Rag the Nuts Off and other channels where I've created something from my own perspective to answer my own frustrations or to help me improve in a certain area and it's always been those videos, it's always that type of video which just organically does exceptionally well so that World of Tanks video was where to shoot in the world of tanks. And yes, it may be several years old, but it's still applicable today. You just pick a feature and you shoot at it. That was the, the basic summary. And of course that pick, got picked up within that specific community. Um, I did a, an MX-5 video. Oh, that was my midlife crisis. I bought 41 <laughs> MX-5s. So most people would have had an affair or I don't know. You know got them after me, like I, I don't know. I, I don't know what yeah. normal people do. Um, no, I brought 41 MX-5s uh, and so uh, I had a lot of knowledge around those so I made a video on MX-5s and I, it is lit daily occurrence for comments on that video and I, I, the point of that one was just to help people not get ripped off by buying a Rock Ox MX-5 because the reality was that every one in seven which turned up it was going to be a write-off. So, sorry, sorry. Only one in seven I could save. The other six were just absolute rock boxes, oh. um, which was unfortunate. That, that was not my original goal. Um, my original goal was to save some MX fives, but I can now strip, strip. I mean, literally strip anything of value off an MX five in four hours flat. Um, that includes engine out, diff out, the whole lot, hubs. Wow, that's Amen. impressive. That's yeah, a great and, part. Yeah, and uh, but that's another example oh uh, screw it let's do it i have no mechanical background in the background but one of my friends is a mechanic uh he was moving garages at that point in time he was strapped for cash so i bought a ramp i said can i just use this ramp a ramp has and when i need it and he was like hell yeah matt this is amazing um and of course i was giving him work at the same time as well so we had that going so yeah every friday he was stripping an mx5 um it's <laughs> it's <laughs> And it's like, well, it's already, it's going to the scrapper anyway. I can't break it. You know, nice. it's already broke. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, the, one on. of the things I, I remember, like one of the first videos I saw of you, I think it was like one of my first planes was the Bonsai. Mm. Not, and uh, yeah, so I remember. <laughs> there <laughs> here we go. The only wall hanging model, which I have, the only model, and there's cobwebs on it. I will yeah. ever own and I put on a wall is the bonsai. That is my original bonsai. Yeah. And you can see, like, there's just chunks missing out of it. It has, it, it doesn't even fly well anymore because every single glue joint inside of it has broken more than once. <laughs> uh, and yeah. <laughs> and that's why that, that, the Hobby King brought out another version of the bonsai. Uh, and they just absolutely ruined it. They, I genuinely feel they ruined it. They took a. How do you take a model and make it worse? I, I just <laughs> yeah, don't I trying to figure out. <laughs> I, I just don't understand it. So, you were saying the first video you saw was the the bonsai. Actually, I was, I was wrong. It was actually the Texumo, and that was 
we were like at, at the point our, I saw you, you were taking actual like plywood and glued it to the bottom of the plane so it wouldn't break. <laughs> right, those of you which have owned the Texumo, which was like the go-to ring of all time, yes, is that I managed to kill a Texumo, and I, I, I kid you not, it, it turned to snow where it hit that ground so hard. You couldn't even save it hot. It would have all been hot blue in that nose. It was so bad. I was so upset that day. I really was. I'd run it on 4S and, um, of course, then the bet cut out and I couldn't pull out of the dive, which I was doing. Um, and it just went in that grain hard. It was such a mess. And it just, I just couldn't save it. And I was so upset. I still remember that so passionately now. That, that, that I was so annoyed with myself. <laughs> And then from that day onwards, I think I owned always them two Texumos. I think I still own two Texumos now. I think yeah. I've still got two Texumos in the garage, in, in the cellar. They, they are, they're just a great wing. I didn't, they just go on forever, you know? And Fantastic. Right yeah, yeah. And in fact, that was what you used for your first, your whole INAP series. Mm. It was the Texuma, right? Orange Texuma. Uh, yeah. No, I, I no, I originally I remember with you showing flying missions with it. Was that one? No, S S eight hundred wasn't it? Might have been the S eight hundred, but I, I can't remember which model it was. To be honest, yeah. no, I, I still remember using Clean Flight with Inav. Uh, sorry, with um, on a Texumo. I have not, and I probably will not ever see a flying wing position hold in the sky flat like that. It even got the attitude right. That was clean flight. And I did um, position hold on it. And it it just prop hanged in the sky. <laughs> I have never, ever seen anything like it. And it just held the attitude perfectly. And uh, I just remember, the, the, I think Craig was there with me at the time. He was going... <laughs> so, yeah, when INAV turned up, I was very, very happy because clean flight said it did all these things and actually for fixed wing it didn't do it at all so crazy but yeah it might have been the S. I, I genuinely can't remember and i've put inav in so many different models since so yeah. i mean so what's your attraction to inav i mean uh, you were flying all these line of sight planes and all of a sudden you're into inav oh cost purely down to cost so i i, I know that i might upset some people but I do personally feel that the Eagle Tree Vector is like the de facto standard of flight controllers. However, and that comes with a big, however, it's 200 quid. So the best part of 300 USD for yeah. this controller. And it is such a well polished all in one product. However, I already own four vectors and they are in a collection of different models. I needed options. Well, back in that time, I only needed two, and I thought that was a lot. I'd managed to pick up two since. Uh, so INAV was this absolute fascination because I could use this flight controller board and it could basically do what the Vector did and for the 50 quid all in, because it was the flight controller and a, a puck, wasn't it? A GPS puck. That was the basic, that's what you needed. Um, but where the expense was, was time that is that that was the difference where whereas the vector once you actually read the manual is that you can go to a, and obviously experience now comes in with a lineup because it has progressed massively since then but in short with a vector you can turn up at the flight line you fly it once land trim incorporate the trims and you're golden you don't touch it after that 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 is the vector and every time which you then go out to fly the vector it just works Whereas the, with INAV on the flip side, and maybe you may have caught that in the INAV video a couple of days ago, a slight bit of frustration that the, unfortunately the, the setup process is not on par, unfortunately not on par with the Vector, because the Vector rich literally is you just fly the model, trim it in, land it, and job's a good one. Um, whereas INAV, it's not that. Um, it would be fantastic if it got to that stage. And I can see that stage coming sometime in the future. It's not, it's we're only dealing with code. And the thing is that with software is that the one thing, and it's the hardest thing to, 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 to comprehend is that with software, anything is possible. 
So that day will come where INAV supersedes the vector in all features and functions and yeah. stability. So to, to come back to your question, where, where did the INAV, it just came from cost. It was cheaper. Yeah. So I could have four flight controllers for the cost of one vector. I think that was my point back in the original INAV series was that 50 quid, give or take, you can have four of these for one vector, and it's nuts because everything was besides the board and a puck. It was basically free. You just needed to uh, input your time. And talking of time, coming back now with iNav 2.5, and I've actually got a little mini series which I'm halfway chipping away at. Uh, not a series, sorry, just a video. It's just it, my goal was iNav 100 seconds. That's not happening in short, but it would be iNav as fast as possible. Um, we, I'm just working through, and you literally, I know, is now just fantastic. You just start on the first tab and just work your way through. Um, and of course, once you've then got one model, which I think I discussed in the other video, once you've got a model, which you've got your OSDs or OSDs screen set up how you like, you can just copy it off one model and paste it into the other. Yeah. Um, that that it has become an awful lot quicker, and it does become easier as well. And that's the big secret. You, know, you start doing that, then all of a sudden you start realizing I can make five more planes, <laughs> and then all of a sudden they start showing up. So basically, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can have five more planes for stabilizing them, yeah. uh, and, and they can come home if I screw up. I think, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And the, the thing to remember is that I am always going to be a fan of iNav because iNav has saved my ass in a model before. I've only had to click return in anger, and I did. We've all it returns very because we can't be asked to fly him, let's be honest. All right. <laughs> it's coming home, you're like, fuck it, whatever. You know? Um, we, we've all had those moments. Oh, we've smelt the coffee in our lap, all right? That, that also happened on the flight line. Uh, there's other maybe calls of nature which have made me need to go on. Um, but no, on a serious point, I now saved the model where I physically could not save the model. Um, I was caught up in a corner behind some trees. We had we not only had, it was a really sunny day, we had tons of thermal, and we had the wind coming over, and it was in this turbulent spot. And it, it wasn't that far away. It was, what, 150 metres away tops, you know? Um, so we're not sort of like 10 miles away or something daft. It was literally just over there. I physically, manually could not save that model, and it would click, 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 and I couldn't have been more than like a couple of metres off the ground, and I now got me home. Uh, yeah. And it was only like there to, to there, and that that bit's always stayed with me. It did what it needed to do in that moment of oh my god, I am not saving this. Click click clunk, <laughs> and it came home. I, I was just like, I still remember that day very vividly. Um, and yeah, because we'd spent the like previous 20, 30 minutes catching thermals, flying around, having an absolute weight at the time, and then just came right came down to to muck around in some trees and got myself in a sticky situation and it came home so yeah Mark, is there a question yeah i had i had a, a very similar situation uh, last year with my uh, high speed ar wing so i just finished building it and i was flying out there uh, on the fields and Fuck, it, is that your a, ar wing that mental little black thing which you were doing the vertical takeoffs with no it's not that. No, so I found a YouTube channel like like two days ago, and somebody's got that mini AR wing, yeah. um, and they're doing vertical takeoffs with it, and it's absolutely <laughs> bonkers. Like I, I really must get back and find out what power plant he's got in it because I got one up there. Yeah, I, I've seen a few of them. Uh, I mean, my AR wing are also I have the uh, wooden wing that's on it, so they are very stiff. I could also just put it on the ground and just throttle up; it would go straight up. So I have this uh, Racer Star RB motor on it with an 8 by 7 inch prop and 4S. So top speed is 180 kilometers per hour. It has around 2 kilogram pure static thrust. So mm -hmm. it would go straight up. Yeah, and uh, last year I had a similar situation where I have really saved my plane. I was flying uh, very low and did some tricks, go inverted and rolls very close to the ground. And while I was rolling, suddenly I was uh, I vanished behind a hill. So my video feed and my uh, transmitter feed immediately dropped while I was was inverted. And I now <laughs> really turned around, pulled up about two meters off the ground with 120 kilometers per hour, <laughs> and then the plane flew straight back. So it really saved it. 
Yeah, I, I think once you got one of those moments underneath your belt with with Inav, you're you're suddenly like an instant fan. Yeah, uh, yes. I have, it, it, it I have, could be copying your lap. It could be you don't remember it and lost your feed. I have uh, seen a story recently, a video from some guy. It was in a German group, if I remember correctly. Uh, he was flying with a buddy together. They were about 500 to 700 meters away, and they had a mid-air crash. And uh, in this mid-air, his friend's plane completely gra crashed, and his plane lost a servo. So he had no control, oh, not at all, but he was about 200 or 300 meters up. So he had no control anymore. It was impossible to fly the plane, and then he just said to himself, okay, fuck off, turned off the receiver, started to pack his stuff together, and suddenly he heard his plane. And Einaf managed to uh, fly back a Delta ring with just one working servo for some reason. <laughs> That's insane. That's, That's nuts. Nice. That even sounds like a challenge, doesn't it? That sounds like we should get a Bixler and then we should just <laughs> disconnect the, one of the Aideron servos. And I tell you what, you're kidding not, you can still fly, a, uh, uh, still fly a Bixler without an elevator anyway. Uh, you, can, yep. you can manage it underneath the throttle because I've done it and I saw Andy do it at the farm a while, while back as well. He literally took off and the elevator wasn't working, but you still managed to fly. So maybe that's the challenge. Just take, start taking away things and see how I now copes. Um, that's actually what uh, Luke does with his long range plane. So he has a flight controller in there, but the flight controller only controls one half of the plane. Only one aileron and uh, one half of the elevator. So the other side is controlled manually, or <laughs> with with a second flight controller. But he can control it manually. I, I have no idea how he set that up. <laughs> so basically, if his flight controller completely fails, he is still able to fly the ba uh, plane back. That that's gonna be pretty rare, though. Um, it depends what distance you're doing. Why yeah, you he's got to be, bizarre yeah, stuff. Yeah. Why I mean, he's be doing that. I mean, he flew Genius. his plane inside on a on a on a rope <laughs> in his room. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a lot of fun. He's just <laughs> crazy. Uh, crazy. By the way, there, there was a, you, you were talking about. Sorry, you were talking about uh, quad pilots coming to so so reasons why somebody would want to use iNav. There was actually another reason which we didn't actually twig, uh, and I've heard multiple people doing it. Is training in a training mode. So yeah. if you use altitude hold then you can literally just give the transmitter to, to your lad or your daughter and yeah. don't pull back or push That's down, just point. go lefty and righty and just leave them to it. Just look, just play with that one stick, you know? Uh, there's the goggles on. If you get stuck, click that switch in the top right-hand corner. Uh, and that is, again, altitude hold is absolutely right. fantastic for just training. Of course, you're limited on bank angle. They can't fly away that far. And if they went out of receiver range, then it would fail safe and come back anyway. Um, which, by the way, that's one thing which every, anybody who's watching this and using INAB, Clyde, make sure your fail safe works. I got caught out yesterday with that. Sat down, put the goggles on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 right. Rick, just just tweak the power setting on the uh, crossfire. Has <laughs> uh, it gone off on a little mission of its own? Uh, and that was a complete mistake on my part. I, I'd obviously not been through my the processes correctly, uh, and the model didn't fail safe. So, and, and there was actually two errors which I've made. And again, this is nice. I, feel it important to share this. There was two mistakes which I'd made is that it was a new receiver and I've not set it up to be 12 channel instead of eight channel. So I didn't have the additional four channels. And of course in channel 11 is my fail safe marker. So that when I set the fail safe on the receiver, which I did, which was into return to home, but the board I now didn't realize it was in a fail safe condition uh, and just carried on flying in a straight line with zero RSSI and because I'd not set the four channels on there and of course one of them the channel was the fail safe so that when it does drop out it clicks fail safe and, and returns home at the same time as a separate mode uh, about, which I've set up for because I'm using about oh. two years ago I had a similar story uh, it was with INAF 2.0 or 2.1 I think I think it was 2.0 it was just freshly released and uh, back then, INAF had no option to uh, make missions out of transmitter range. That was introduced with 
2.2, I think. And Can I just go on the record and just try to put in my missions are absolutely amazing. I had yeah. broke my mission virginity last week. It was <laughs> absolutely brilliant. You, and it was just you, I had the coffee and everything. It was amazing. <laughs> Sorry, Mark, I don't mean the bucket uh, button. Yeah, on, if, if 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 you look on my channel, uh, I just released a video a few weeks ago uh, where I have chased my own plane. So I started the 250G, sent it on a face uh, on a on a uh, complete autonomous INAV mission that would last about 30 minutes or so, just in zigzag above me, and then I switched my transmitter, started my quad, and chased my own plane while it was on a mission. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, absolutely love it. Yeah, and by about, the way, yeah, go, go on. Uh, and about two years ago, uh, with my first INAF AR ring, uh, I tried to disable uh, face safe on purpose just to say, uh, continue with whatever you are doing right now uh, to try to fly uh, missions out of range. Uh, they didn't work well. So for some reason, it always, uh, instead of continuing the mission, it went into acro mode. Uh, so I thought, okay. <laughs> Screw it! I just fly around a little bit, and then I made the mistakes and uh, mistake and flew around in uh, 3D cruise mode, and I lost connection, and it uh -oh. stayed in 3D cruise mode at about 60 meters altitude, and it did a 14 kilometer flight and crashed with <laughs> an empty battery, and it was found about three months later. <laughs> wow! <laughs> I hope, like, that's actually that. interesting. I remember one of my first FPV experiences, I, and the first model, well, the only model I've ever, ever, ever lost. Um, I, and the irony, I wasn't flying it. Well, that I, I'd given actually to the club chairman uh, up there, and he'd flown it, and he thought he was over there, but he was actually over there. And this poor little wing wing, I didn't see it again. Well, I didn't see it again until the harvest time. And Mr. Farmer came round and said, is that yours? Uh, and that was actually, again, uh, going, going off topic slightly, pe people think that um, farmers or landowners are horrible people, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, my personal, find, my own findings with farmers specifically is that they are generally really nice people if you approach them in the right way because i still remember that night he'd popped around with his model uh, and anyway i popped back around to to say thank you and i think we ended up chatting in his barn uh for about two hours it, it, it was even his daughter came in which like, like you can imagine like this stereotypical english farmer's wife you know <laughs> and that was his daughter and um, she was huge like um, red and white check skirt and everything that came in it was it was it was hilarious and and yeah she brought us coffee and we had cake and we just are you staying for dinner uh, love yeah, it, it, it's <laughs> um but yeah i'm glad that you got it back because and again that was the, uh, highlighted very early on the requirement for the model to to come home if you screw it up yeah you you talked about uh the trainer mode before so uh, what i actually did sometime uh, i was out with some friends flying and one of them never ever flew any rc plane so uh i know that there are systems to have a control transmitter and a trainer transmitter and you just take over if something happens but what mm. i actually did with uh, these complete newbie guys that never flew an rc plane before i launched it i fly up at 100 meters or so safe altitude then i gave him the transmitter so he can fly while I watch on the monitor or on my goggles and just keep my finger on the return to home switch. And if anything goes wrong, if I see, okay, he loses control, he loses orientation, whatever, I just flick the switch and I have saves and flies back. Yeah, it it's is better than any trainer mode. Yeah, absolutely. They, they, probably the one thing which actually was just springing to mind when you were discussing that is, is yes, absolutely. I've got a similar scenario coming up. Um, very, very shortly with somebody who wants to fly and I'll just be using altitude hold and stabilize and just off you go, you know, just enjoy the experience and we'll build up from there. The the one thing which I actually recently saw, because I didn't know much about it, so I quickly watched a video on it by Sir Nguyen, uh, is that it was to do with a co-pilot. And one of the really nice things which I liked about this OHD co-pilot is that you had a geo fence on it. So that it, if it went out, it was just that little potentiometer. I, th I thought that was absolutely really good thinking because A, they just simplified it to the point of idiot proof. Uh, and B, they had geofenced it as well. So that if it went out of that fence, obviously you turn it around to the left a little bit more, 
uh, is that it would just ping back and come back. Maybe that might be a cool feature uh, to see in, in the future if it does go outside of that range, just as a set of training fe features within iLab to, 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 to improve the experience for that genre of person. Yeah. And well, great, sorry, I was just, just going to say, with, with the new 2.5, with the special functions and global, uh, whatever they're called, you could actually set up a geofence if it goes say 200 meters away from the home point it will automatically you can set it to enable return to home and disable it when it's 175 meters so mm -hmm. it's it's a bit of coding but it's it's in there yeah. so yeah it's definitely coming along happy days i i i've been in that town what it does no idea <laughs> but we'll have a look see what it does that'd be pretty cool to set up that'd be quite nice that that would be pretty cool uh, to be honest i think it really needs to be its own flight mode for example literally just have a flight mode called trainer which yeah. is it's geofenced to say 500 meters uh and then when it's clicked into that it, it alters your holds and stabilizes and then maybe just have a user setting uh for that that actual geofence if they want to change it beyond 500 meters because keep, keep the plane not flying above 200 meters not below 50 meters so that way that you know, it knows if it tries to go down or up too high, you you can bring it back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, we're let we're out. Dealing so we're dealing with software, so anything is possible. Yeah. Uh, and, and we, you just explained what it should do in one sentence. It should go no further than 500 meters, no higher than 200 meters, no lower than 550 meters, and be a stabilized mode. Yeah. That programmically is child's play. It's, but it, but, it, but you, I just thought about it. You need to be very careful not to put it into position hold mode instead, because th then you won't be able to get it back. <laughs> <laughs> it will loiter then uh, inf infinitely. <laughs> yeah. Point. So yeah. So in in that really does need to be its own flight mode. So then there are the other logic steps which rule position hold out, so that you can get the mode or get the model back. So you can make. No, we should be clear though that in position hole, if you fail safe, you will go to return to home. Yeah, if you're it flying should, it should, yeah. in position hole. Yeah. yeah. So unless it's kind of, you override it. The only the only things I did yet with the global functions and the uh, variables is uh, for uh, my Dart 250G, for example, I have a, a automatic VTX power level switching depending on the distance. Uh, um, 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 um. Okay, I have a, I have a you, brain, brain lock right now. Get back to it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I got a question for you. To see some real use cases for special functions, because like I said, I, I know it's there, and I've kind of half looked. Have I actually done it? No, not at all. Yeah. The reason, uh, the reason why I use it on the Dodge Winner Twenty G is just because uh, it's a very small plane. It uh, has a cruise power, the motor power for cruise at one point two amps or so, and mm -hmm. if my VTX is always on full power, it uses zero point six amps, so it's uh, a third of the whole plane power consumption in flight. So I want to have it just as high as needed. And the second thing, what I did was on my Talon GT. Uh, it has an automatic check for distance and altitude to automatically turn on the uh, the position lights. So if I, for example, do an evening or maybe a night flight, uh, the position lights only turn on if I'm at least one kilometer away or and at, le uh, at least 300 meters up. So it's just on if I'm very high and very far away. So at mm. night, no one sees when I, where I land, for example. <laughs> so Matt... Couple questions for you, please. Good. Um, the, so I'm gonna look, fire them both off at the same time. First one is um, drag the nets off. So I want to hear the logic behind that. I mean, are you are you really going to try to break the plane? Basically, have, watch it fall apart in the air. And then the other one is you always mention I paid for this with a model of my own money. So those are two things that people. I want to make it clear. It's like I, I think what happens sometimes people like tune in. Or they go to our page or whatever, and man, we're paying for all this stuff ourselves. We're, there's no sponsor behind us paying for this stuff, and so yeah, you know, it's like we make no money off these uh, pages. So we just we're in this for the love of the hobby. So when you say that this, I bought this model with my own money, you mean it, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. So let me come let me come back to that. One. Let me come to rag the nuts off. So. 
where that phrase came from is that I used it with that bonsai literally there because I stuck <laughs> this um, SE 2206 2300 kV motor which I bought from Hobby RC um, and I still had, if you go and check on our website, I don't know if it's still up there, but there's a review on that just saying like the, the, the grey hairs on the flight line absolutely hated it because it absolutely shredded the sky. New one. It was brilliant. <laughs> um, and I'd said, in, not knowingly, said, said in a video which I'd recorded, I'm going to rag the nuts off this one. Um, <laughs> as in the, I'm just going to smash it around the sky and just don't care. That, yeah. that, that was the whole point. No, it was literally just rag the nuts off it. It was to, to, to fly at and beyond my personal limits. Uh, uh, and, and that's, and I, I still remember going, I, I still remember me spotting that I had said that. And there was a chap who was around at the very beginning, Gourmetius RC, who I, I, unfortunately I thought the chap had passed away. Um, but no, he is still alive. <laughs> Uh, and I still remember chatting to that chap and said, I'm going to call it that. I'm going to call this Rag the Nuts Off from that one slew, which I had uh, uh, up on the flight line quite a while ago. Uh, so to answer your other question, um, so for absolute clarity, there are only ever two models which I've ever received free. Uh, the first one was, was a... Uh, Dancing, Rain, da Dancing Wings Rainbow Wing, which I still own to this day and still fly from time to time out the front. I think my, I think it's great. It's not a bonsai, but you couldn't buy the EPP for that money right. at all. Is it uh, the 800 it, millimeter or the 1000 millimeter? Uh, I can't remember. It wasn't that big. No, it was just, it was the smaller one, the one which if you smash in the ground, you snap the wing off kind of thing. Um, it it once you'd realised that you couldn't overpower it because it would flap in the sky, it was absolutely yeah. hilarious. I that still was chuck it up on the slope and it was yeah. flat, it was flat, flat, flat. flat. <laughs> I've seen that before, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, so we had that one, and uh, like I said, I, I still own it to, 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 to today, it's down in the cellar and it's still set up ready to go. I think it's even got the receiver still sat at it. Uh, and there was an Edge 540, which was frankly too good to, to, to not say no to at the time. Um, because I wanted to get into some, some 3D flying uh, and it was an absolutely gorgeous model. It was an absolutely gorgeous model. But th those are the two models which I've only ever received for free. Dancing Wings, Rainbow Wing still own. Uh, and the Edge 540 went to a chap just outside of Bristol, actually. A really nice guy. I um, can't remember his name, but he is actually a drone instructor, instructor a drone flying instructor. Uh, and, uh, and it went to a, to, to a good home. Um, but besides that, the, the reason why we see me say, and ever since those two, however many years ago, we have, uh, and it's Napa, not a free before review, is because I got a, it was one of the things which I identified very early on, which is that there were a lot of freebies going around and I'd made a few biased decisions on things which I purchased, uh, which I wasn't personally happy with. And I decided that that would be, um, so from like the business world, it would be a unique selling point. Uh, it would be something which would separate you from somebody else. Uh, and there are a collection of things with Back the Nuts Off, which are specifically designed to be different from somebody else because they are things which I feel important, I, I, I hold uh, to be important. And one of those things is not being biased by receiving the models for free. Um, and I, I don't do tactful, I, I'm not a tactful person. Um, I'm inherently, it can get awkward at times, but I, I, I'm inherently, I don't, I don't want to use this word. I, I, I tell the truth, yeah. that's the easiest way of explaining it. Um, I don't like lying. Lies catch you in circles, and I refuse to lie in, on like in a, in, a, in any relationship. It's just I just don't like lying at all. And I feel that receiving, and this is my personal opinion. No, no nothing against anybody else. Um, and that was and that was something which I identified. I, I felt unhappy with that. So, uh, and because I'd always wanted to do YouTube, uh, and I always imagined that I, when I 
got onto YouTube, it would be something e-commerce related, which of course I've been and done in other guy on, on other on on other channels. Uh, but the, the, the rag the nuts off one was that right. If I'm going to do this seriously, and like this is going to be my learning channel, then I put a pot of money to one side, and it was no small pot of money. I can assure you now. Basically, I could buy whatever I wanted for a year, literally anything I wanted for a year, uh, and that's promptly what I did. Um, and that was one of the one of the was was one of the and is this till today one of the de facto standards which i'm very proud to be able to say is the the model which you're seeing so like the drift for example i i genuinely feel i i i like it a lot i know i'm not going to use other words for it i genuinely really like it it's not fast it's not a bonsai with a stupid great big mayo in it it is the model which i went off on a little journey on a little mission and we might have and absolutely loved it i sat there and I know it's not fast. I know it it can take a smack, you know, um, and that maybe that's something which I've come back the second time around now. <laughs> Mark's holding up his. They are brilliant. I, I I think it's a brilliant. And actually, I want to say a hats off to anybody who's managed to cram that F four eleven, um, that Maytek four eleven WSB board in there. Because I looked, at, <laughs> I, had four, <laughs> I had I, I had four. So I received it Saturday morning. Sorry, I'm derailing myself now. That, that drift, received it Saturday morning, did an unboxing video, edited it, then decided, nah, screw it, let's go and do a maiden video. So whipped over the playing fields, did a quick playing maiden video of it, learned a few things about it, like CG was wrong in it as well. Um, and then I had four hours to finish, finish off the daddy drift. Do you know how big that thing is? Absolutely <laughs> monstrous. I had so many things which I needed to do to finish it, to get it out for, for its maiden on the Sunday. And I had to stick iNav in there. And I took one look at that little Maytech double, because it's not a single board, it's a double board. And right. I was thinking, well, that's not going to fit in there. And that, that lid's not going to go down. I've got so much wiring to do in there. Um, and, yeah, I had four hours to do that and get the daddy track. So it's just got a single flight controller board in there, a little 30 by a 20 by 20 board. And it works absolutely brilliantly. Oh. So I derailed myself. Coming back to buy with the models themselves is the in on before once i would made that serious decision to focus upon youtube more seriously and do a video every single day for a year which i think there was one or two days which i might have skipped but if you think 360 videos and i think i actually published about 450 um i think i did quite well in the year um is i had a very clear set i had a very clear understanding of a what needed to be done and i didn't worry about the small details because going back to what we were chatting about earlier steve when I mean, you said about once you you wake up in the middle of the night with an idea it hits you in the face clear as day um and you just write it down and you then go and do it or you might have something which is funny and you find you're, you're in the middle of tesco's and you're laughing your head off <laughs> and people are walking past you um because you've come up with this stupid idea um, which I can say because that one was not particularly correct at all. Um, so yeah, I do take my go around with my phone and I do take a lot of notes on stuff. Um, so anyway, coming back, <laughs> is that I had a very clear set of goals. I had a very clear idea on how to monetize it, uh, and I always knew that on day one, that when I started, that whatever I spent, I would probably earn back and more by the end of it. Um, so that way, again, that's one of the nice things about having a previous background with um, other businesses and things like that, knowing full well. Uh, and this is something which I've, I, I've tried and, and will continue to, to encourage my, my own children with, which is that, look, just don't do anything for money. Money is like, if you do something with absolute commitment and passion, with passion, money just sorts itself out. It's really weird to explain this, but it does sort itself out. I, I, I don't. Think I, I'm not a lucky person. I don't. I never won the lottery. Anything. Well, I did. I won two pound fifty. Um, the days ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not a lucky person, but I, I make my own luck because just brute force, I work my way through things. So in the beginning, I knew that that was quite a lot of money which I put down on the table in a specific fund. And I treated it as a business. 
I knew that by the end of year one, I would have probably cleared that and some more. And I remember having a conversation with a friend uh, and I explained what had happened. And because that I still remember the day when I'd covered the amount which I put in the kitty in the beginning. And when I say it was no small amount, it was no small amount uh, in the beginning. And I, and I covered that. So you, you can, the point which I'm trying to make is that yes, you can make money from YouTube. Uh, if you're willing to to put the effort in um, and maybe if your ethics are good as well. I've seen other people attempt things, not in with the IC um, community, within other things and it's been very clear that, that maybe their motivations are slightly different. Um, and I do also have, um, I, I, I've watched my children watch channels like Unspeakable, for example. So those of you which got kids, there's an American chap called um, I don't even know what his name is, um, or, or LD Shadow Lady as well, who does Minecraft and uh, Roblox and things like that. Uh, and she is just absolutely hilarious. And she just goes off in a world of her own. <laughs> and people enjoy her sense of humor. And like it's a million views on, on every video, you know? Oh, the uh, game players, yeah. So they're playing games and they're chatting. Yeah, yeah. They're chatting. And they have yeah. so much character to them as well. But the one thing I want to do to that, that that's the other brutal reality is that whatever I'm doing right now and whatever I've done in the past is at its child's, it's amateur work compared to the guys who are doing it seriously. So if I'm using Unspeakable just as an, as an easy reference. That guy must have an absolute itinerary. They, they, they have an entire house. They wreck the house. You know, they, they fill their swimming pool up with balls it's, it, or blocks of ice. And you think, you, you see the ice which has turned up and it's crystal clear ice. That was top premium ice. That was the best, pro probably about $500 worth of ice. And they blow it in one episode. Maybe because they're earning like $30,000 per episode. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. Where'd yeah. he go? He froze now. Everything Wait, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> he's he's kind of coming back a little bit. <clears throat> so I, Matt, Matt not, froze. Matt, okay. not sure if you hear us, but uh, your screen and your audio is frozen right now. Yeah, I might need a reboot there. So um, let's see. So um, while we're waiting, Mark, there was a question on the chat. So uh, yeah, it. it was for it was for uh, Matt, especially about the uh, drift uh, we talked uh, previously. So I yeah. I, I uh, wanted to keep him talking uh, and then switch back to the drift. But... Yeah, we're gonna get to the drift. Yeah, yeah. Let's get to that. I, know, I know you both want to get uh, re your reviews out. I like to hear what you have to say in English this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let let's wait till uh, Matt is back. Oh, no, no, Wait, there it he is. seems to work again. <laughs> I do apologize. It's yeah, okay. Sorry. No problem. So, uh, Matt, uh, we had a question in the chat pre uh, before uh, when we were talking about the drift uh, already. Uh, Matt, what uh, would you change short of the mods you did to the drift to make it better? And is 250G play not really a good way to go? So let, let's tackle the 250 grams one, which is let's face the reality. Who's going to turn up and actually weigh your model? Let's be brutally <laughs> honest. Yeah. Who's going to turn up and weigh? So it's a nice target to aim for. Um, can you do 250 grams of drift? I think you can if you use a lipo rather than lion. The lion's really heavy, especially the good quality ones. Um, so I think you are going to struggle there, but it, it's not impossible. I think you would do that. Um, there are options if you want to go hardcore, you could cut holes out of the wings and maybe put laminate on top to save a few grams. Um, that, that It depends how far you want to go. But I think the 250 grams is someone else's headache. It really is. The reason why you would want a lightweight model is for flight efficiency. So for example, just going off topic from the drift, I've got the binary on the way to me at the moment. And the goal for that one is not cram it full of stuff, is to keep it as light as sensible so that I can get much as much flight time as possible. Um, it's not like, for example, a mini talon, which you can load it up with an 8004S in there um, or a whole bank of 18650s and it still flies exactly the same if you had a 5204S in it. Um, 
So yeah, coming back to your question about the Dart 250, is that yes, I think you could do it. You'd have to be very careful what you put in that model and you would be restricted to LiPo batteries. So your range would also be very limited. Yeah. To answer the question as far as mods, the one mod which I feel that you must do, and Mark, you will be able to, to, to confirm this for me, is to stick some lamina on those wingtips because those wingtips on the ends are so weak. You can imagine flying, getting a couple of like rougher landings, maybe in deeper grass uh, or on top of a crop, for example. Those wingtips weren't going to last five minutes. And I, it would be such a shame to ruin what is a really nicely well molded. And you can tell. I, I've seen a lot of foam. And I, I put on the bottom of the video, foam connoisseur, um, just to take the piss. But actually, on a serious point, the moulding on it is absolutely fantastic. I really, you, they they don't rinse their mud. So there are models which you get, like the Micro Sky Hunter, and you can tell that they've done a big batch through that because that model is, is is rinsed in release agent where they're slamming the two together, spray, spraying it, and getting through those foam moulds as fast as possible. With that drift, they took their time with it, and it actually shows in the molding. Maybe in a year's time when they've done thousands for it, the, the mold will be on its way out. But anyway, sorry, just getting back to my point, laminate, laminating the leading edge minimum uh, uh, on the wing itself, especially the wingtips, because my wingtips, I'm like, what are your wingtips up here like right on the end? So they're really quite flimsy. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> so as Mark is there, do you want to just say something there, Mark, so they switches to your camera? Yeah, yeah. I, I switched to my camera right now. Um, yeah. To be honest, uh, yesterday on the maiden flight, uh, I, I think I'm not sure if you have seen the video yet. Um, I had actually a ring tip crash, so I was flying very low altitude below the below the trees, and on one of the trees there were some uh, branches hanging down, and I actually hit the branch with the left ring, so the plane mm -hmm. crashed into the ground. There's nothing, absolutely nothing visible the only thing i nearly lost my uh, front canopy because the canopy fell off on impact and i didn't realize it when i brought the plane back but uh, mm -hmm. there's absolutely nothing what i think is because these ring tips are so flimsy they won't actually break i think they will dampen the crash instead of breaking <laughs> off the on the only thing what i was uh, wondering about when you did your review or oh, sorry it's a little bit loud right now. Uh, when you did your review, you said the uh, carbon spars here were loose on one ring, right? Yeah, it literally fell out of my hand. We noticed that when we were, it was Josh, which I thankfully noticed that, because he, he picked it up and he, he was saying, I'm looking at this uh, scale model of an RC plane. I still remember Josh saying that. And then literally just after we cut to that bit, we finished recording that bit, he was going like, Matt, that left wing, that spar is moving up and down in it. And it was both on the right wing and literally the, when I got home, we put a bit of tape over it just to fix it for the for the rest of the day. But literally when I got home, that spar just popped out in my hand. There was like one bit of glue over there and that was it uh, in it. So yeah, do just check your spars. But the, 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 the easy remedy to that is that A, manually check them, but also if you put lamina up and I don't know how well it's coming out on the screen, but you've literally just gone over uh, with the lamina on there and I've done the wing tips. And of course, the the lead, the sort of front edge on the tail fin as well, just to keep it nice. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I did the bottom of my fuselage. Um, so yeah, that, that is mods. That's so this it. is interesting it because keep it, keep when, this it thing, nice. when this came out, Mark was like, he starts messaging Darren and myself, like, it's coming out. I can't believe it. He was so excited, <laughs> and and then all of a sudden, like Andrew Newton has one, like a you know a week before everyone else does, and he's flying it and he's giggling and laughing. So I was really interested in what you guys had to say about it. And so, kind of like you like it, but it's not like a love fest with this plan. Yeah, oh, no, I like it. I know, and I mean, I like it a lot. It is yeah. because it's because what it enables me to do. So this isn't. So the drift isn't perhaps the the model to go and blast and cut through trees and things like that. For me, what the drift enables me to do is fly from home. That is um, what I'm after. There is absolutely zero noise to it. When it gets in the screen, my, you, you, I just saw you nodded down there. Yep. You can't hear it. Yep. You can't hear it. And once you get high, you can't see it either. 
Yeah. So that is really attractive. Uh, <laughs> talking about proximity stuff, uh, I'm a little bit in a different opinion about the drift because uh, if I use my Dart 250G, it's a pretty fast plane. So it it needs to have some speed like 60 to 70 to be really stable and uh, to fly on spot and keep altitude perfectly. But uh, if I do proximity flying and you do just a little mistake in the control, uh, you will hit something. And that's what I really like on the, on the drift actually is... Uh, it was the first time that I ever flew below a tree with a plane. I, I didn't even do that with the uh, 250G because it's just faster and every mistake uh, does not, it doesn't forgive any mistakes. And here you have so much time because it's flying so slow. And uh, Robert in the chat is asking what uh, or says, I don't understand the short spar. Uh, I think you mean this piece here. Actually, this isn't a too dumb idea. Because if you uh, take the plane apart uh, and put it in your bag, you don't want to have a 60, 70 centimeter uh, carbon spar, spar with you separately. And what it actually does is the rings have carbon spars on both sides and this thick spar is sandwiched in between them. So, uh, and you have also, if, uh, sh if I shine the light through, okay, I have no light from the back right now. If you shine the light through, you see these uh, PCP board where the connector is also integrated goes uh, alongside all these bars. So it's completely sandwiched in between. It's really, really stable in there. So that's the reason for the short spa. And if I yeah, and Mark, just to add to that, and that, that's actually the first time I've looked at it since I've unboxed it, which was the, and because I just put the spa to on it, but I'm fly it to be brutally honest, um, is that I've just noticed that that sent that spa, which you, you pulled out just a few moments ago, that is the two plastic clips which are on top of the wing. So yeah. that spa may be only going in, say, an inch or an inch and a half into the model, but actually that spa is being carried all that black along the top of the wing. So it is being extended. So. It is short, but actually, it's just an extension. It's a short piece, which is actually being extended by whatever long that is. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. So and what I what I just do is if I want want to put put that plane in my bag, I just open the battery hatch, put the carbon spot inside there, and put the hatch back so I don't lose it. So I just transport it that way. It's that's it's pretty like, like an a nice little plane to put in your back of your car if you're yeah. traveling and yeah. just kind of, you know, you find a small park somewhere. I mean, I mean, uh, if you look at that, you just uh, turn this back rear here. Oh, you have a clip on this on the on the uh, elevator servo here. So I just push up that clip, then I can pull out it, pull it out from the servo, and you have removed the the back of the plane. Yes. Yeah, actually, a tip for you, Mark, is that um, I saw where your servo was mounted in that bottom control horn. My, my actual elevator is in the second hole out from the um, center of the servo on the control horn, because I did start right out on the end, and it was absolutely wild. Um, and now I'm the second hole out on the servo control horn from the center of the servo, just to calm it down. Um, the manual actually says it should be placed in the middle hole because the middle hole is actually a little bit bigger, so it only fits there. But even in the middle hole, I put uh, I have uh, set up my throws in the in the transmitter to match the 10 millimeters up and down movement. It was way too much, way yeah, too it was, much. It was insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that was exactly a representation of my maiden yesterday. Uh, I have also shown it in my video. It was really hard to control. Uh, so I think I'm now at about seven millimeter throw. That's absolutely perfect. And if I fly uh, and I do a bank and yank with full elevator up, it literally turns on spot. It's still so fast. So uh, the manual with 10 millimeter, it's it's a little bit too much. And I uh, put a little bit more throw on the uh, ailerons because it was a little bit too slow on roll. So the uh, ailerons actually have about 10 millimeter throw on mine now. Just back yeah. to the, the short joining spar, you find a lot of gliders have just really short spars just to hold the wings together. As long as the wing themselves are built well, it doesn't really matter, but it's only a short spar in the middle. I mean, I've got a, a hotliner up there, which has got you know, a spar that long, and the, the rest of the wing is just built to take the load from the spar. So just because it's a short joining spar doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be a weak wing. 
So it's yeah. just another another point. Actually, it also depends completely on the on the rate of the model. This model has not much rate to carry around, so the ring load is very low. You still, if I do a very very uh, steep or very hard uh, bank and yank turn, you actually see the rings flexing a little bit. Mm -hmm. You can see that if you fly line of sight, but I don't think that's uh, that uh, this will be any problem. I uh, made a question from my side. Uh, where did you put the flight controller? Up here? Yeah, so actually, th there's actually two bits of feedback which I would give Zoe HD on this model. Um, the first one is the, we'll get to the flight controller position in a moment. The first one is that I really do not, I, the, the rear clip mechanism back there is not strong enough at all. So I've got a piece of tape on mine, um, actually it turns into three. The second one is that the, there's a piece of plywood which runs through the center of the model itself. So you, you, you're kind of limited on space below and you're limited on space on top. So I put mine on top because that was just seemed the most logical place for it to go. Yeah. But what I really liked is that center board to be down more so you can just about fit the ESC and maybe a receiver in there underneath the board and had much much more height on top yeah actually what i did is uh i have i've installed the gps already because it was just so neat i wanted to try out how this bn220t mm -hmm. fits in there and it's just perfect and uh so i have only my vtx on top because yeah. the, the antenna is in front here with a ufa cable directly to the vtx and mm -hmm. here i have an uh free sky rx uh, x 8R receiver in there temporarily uh, right now, just mm -hmm. squished it in here, and I will put the uh, flight controller down here, so uh, yeah. upside down uh, because you have about two to three millimeter more in height uh, down here in that uh, in that compartment, and as the um, cover is bigger, you also have room to actually solder inside there if needed. Ah. Yeah, like, like I said, I was heavily limited on time for the, the install of mine. One thing which I did do is actually just cut a hole in the side of the model so I can get the USB lead in there. Actually, that's one thing which I want to bring up. Um, Mr. Newton did a video really annoyingly yesterday. And I, I say this really annoyingly because <laughs> I bought the OTG lead to connect up to my phone to iNav because I'd seen this a couple of days back. So I went on Amazon, bought it, bought the wrong lead really frustrating so it would have been at the last night would have been an absolute fluke because we would have had two videos out me uh, sorry andrew chatted about speed um speedy b whatever it's called um and I need to get the name right on it which is here somewhere yeah speedy b which is an app for android i presume it's on the iphone as well uh which you can connect up in the field get your usb lead like that connect that into your model and stick that one in the bottom of your phone and then you basically have iNav on your phone. So no more carting around a laptop, no more trying to remember stick commands, which you don't know whether they work or not because there's nothing on the screen and I am theater the buzzer. Um, so you can control even missions via your phone from having an OTG lead. And really annoyingly, I bought the wrong one. So my phone's got a USB-C on the bottom of it and you need a USB-C to the OTG connector on the bottom and then just a normal micro USB-B into the model. And I did it the wrong way around. I bought the, the OTG cable with the micro USB on it. I think can you plug it into that, the model, into the okay. flight control first. Have you seen that uh, teaser picture for the new Matek flight controller, the F742, I think? The A no, no, the H742. H, right. Yeah. So they are uh, they are working on a new uh, ring board uh, with an H7 proce processor, uh, July I think um, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the release plan and uh, it has no USB directly on the flight controller. It just has a JST connector with a separate breakout board. Uh, that includes the USB, a buzzer, and some kind of switch. I'm not sure what this switch is about. It's mm. also re really interesting if you have really big models or really closed-up models to just place the USB port wherever you want. Yeah, that, that's it. No, I, ha I haven't seen that. And I'm also really impressed by what Maytech have been doing. Their kit, which has come out, has been... Can you name a bad Maytech product? I can. Yeah. Um, that's really hard to do for, uh, for other companies. Uh, I have to, I have... <laughs> the video filtering is crap on that. 
Well, actually, there's no video filtering. That's the only one, though. The, the F4 on one wing, the original, the, the video is terrible if you draw more than about 20, 25 amps. Under that, it seems to be okay, but more the, powerful stuff. The only bad item from Matek I had yet was uh, the Matek buzzer. I ordered two of them, and one of them directly started to uh, to, to to crackling, and uh, it's very, very, very bad. I have not yet tested the other one either, so <laughs> it's, it's still working in my uh, Talent GT. I was too lazy to replace it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sorry, I, I got derailed there. Uh, from, no, I haven't seen that one. Um, the one thing which I did notice a couple of days ago when I was looking for F7 flight controller boards, I did find one board which they actually integrated Wi-Fi into it as well. Was it, it was either Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, which actually integrated into the board. I thought that was fantastic. Um, it was a red board. It's on Banggood. I, I think it was just silly expensive and didn't have enough UARTs on it. I think uh, it's the HGLRC uh, wing board. That, uh, I think that has Bluetooth in it, integrated. Yeah, I, I thought that was pretty cool, because that would be, because Bluetooth connector at home on your computer or do it off your phone, I think that would be really super handy. But then again, do you want that extra interference when you're flying on the flight line? Do you want, if you've got a model which is perhaps pushing the normal limits of a model, do you want that extra interference out there? Um, emanating from the model when you've already got something which is probably quite high power video you've got perhaps dvs sending telemetry back right. uh and a, and a noisy esc so the, the things do mount up within the model and they do make a difference they, they do we saw um a couple of days ago um andy he literally had his he, he had um the eagle tree vector gps unit on top of his esc and he was always moaning that he just couldn't get satellites the second he picked it up and moved it away is that it um he, he got all his satellites so on one it's, it's give and take isn't it what we're trying to say there it's nice to have that connectivity but you in certain instances you would not that would not be desirable and so i've just seen you pop that in the chat i'll see if we can find the chat here. yeah i think there are some uh flight controllers with integrated bluetooth like the speedy b for example but the speedy b uh does actually completely power off the bluetooth as soon as your arm the craft so it's a little bit harder to do with external bluetooth devices uh, mm -hmm. but you could for example use uh, a pwm switch separately and uh, just if you have a free uh, server output and then just turn off the power of the bluetooth module as soon as you arm the plane via the P pwm switch that would be mm. an easy task and so you get rid of all the inter inter interferences mm -hmm. I must admit, I do like this approach where you can just plug it in when you need it. I, mean, I, I like the, the whole point. I think of a Bluetooth is it's more convenient, especially at the pit, at the field. If you know, and if you've got a tight space, if it's just something that you could plug in with a, like a four rip, four port cable or whatever, and then take out when you don't want it, then I think that's a, a really good way of doing it. I mean, even yeah. if it's USB like this. Yeah, even something like that on the smaller boards would be immensely helpful because then you could put that USB connector anywhere you wanted in the model. So you're not cutting a hole in the side of the model so you can get the USB leaning there to the flight controller board. Uh, it is on the top or it's just floating around inside and you can just connect it up to as you will. But no, that looks well quite. I, I like the idea. I think that's pretty cool. And also if you knacker that, it goes, if you are a little bit more brutish with that tiny little USB connector, which I may look at and um, I'm sure Mark will stick in the video description uh is that yeah if you did break it well it's not the end of the world because you can just get yeah. another one swap it over yeah. that is the, that is the most fragile piece on out of all so yeah that's well cool i do yeah. like I mean, a while ago you talked about uh, you, you never broke off a USB connector. Uh, I actually managed that two times now. Uh, but the first time was with an uh, HDLRC uh, F4 Flame flight controller. And they were known for their weak USB ports because they were only top soldered on the, bo on the uh, board. And uh, the second time was with a uh, tiny, tiny Whoop with the Mobula 7. It has a replacement board that's uh, able to handle 2S. And also on this board, I broke off the USB because I had to really squeeze it in there because the board was not fitting to the frame correctly. Uh, mm -hmm. But I never managed to do that on a Matic board. I have seen a friend of mine who actually broke off uh, the USB from an F405. 
I have no idea how he did that because it's literally uh, pushed into holes and then soldered from the other side. Yeah. I, I have no idea how you can break off that USB port. Right, I've done it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I can tell you, and what it was was I actually had it plugged in. I had a long cable, <laughs> and I was plugging the long cable into my computer because I always plug it first into the flight control, then into the computer, and that just. I don't know. It just all of a sudden came off, and that's why I learned you have to like glue down these on the F four hundred five. The the <laughs> thing with the vertical USBs is you could get, you can get quite a bit of leverage on them. Yeah. This, yeah. Compared to the the flatter ones, I think. Right. That's it. I mean, especially if you've got like a long, uh, plastic hard plastic bit on your USB cable, you you got a bit more leverage there. I mean, oh yeah, you're absolutely right, Darren. Yeah, I mean, one you would be able to bend that over quite easily. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, one time I forgot that the cable is plugged into my uh, long range AR ring with the F405 flight controller in there. So I took the ring, I turned around, wanted to go to my workbench, and I literally pulled my whole USB hub with all the cables included <laughs> across my desk here, and nothing happens. The board is still fine. <laughs> that's great. Fantastic. So, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, uh, Matt, was. So the whole thing, so we've had you on, we've also had uh, a two-part series with Andrew Newton. We went over all the planes that we loved. That was like one of the first ones we've done. And um, so Andrew has like a different take on things. What he does is he gets free models and he builds them. When you build them, you have to build them exactly the way that they come. You can't sit there and say, these parts are crap and put my favorite parts in. And no, you had to like do it from scratch. And then... Um, but his whole thing was that he just likes the whole video process. He, he's in love with it. So he figures that he can build a plane and get it flying within about four hours. Mm -hmm. So the, a lot of his planes you see on, on his actual, uh, you know, what you're seeing on his channel are planes where the glue is still wet and he's putting it in the air. Mm. So it's... So he is like fantastic about that. And he, he figures he gets about a new plane about every seven days for like the last three years and so he said all his friends don't want any more planes and all their friends don't want any more planes <laughs> I, I quite well believe that i quite well believe yeah. that the, the, the guys the guys which we fly with they they've all had models at some point in time um there, there are models which are cute that there are models which i keep and i've also become a little bit better at them now like the dragon i was really intrigued with and i'd actually bought that before i decided that came out right near the end when I decided to take a break uh, and it had been sat here in a box just next to my desk uh, for absolutely ages and I was really looking forward to flying that and we got it flying in the end CG but way off um, and then it did fly in the end and I, I have become better at quickly identifying where I like a model or not so I know within the first few minutes of it being in the sky, whether I mean whether that twelve and three quarter year old is in love with the model or not. Um, so I mean, that that dragon went on. I think it cost me whatever ninety dollars, whatever it was. Um, it, Andy's had it now, so that's payment for whatever. You know, it, it, it's almost irrelevant. It, 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 I'd rather the model went to a, to a home where it might be flown, because the reality is, is that uh, didn't really like it to be honest needs to go it just needs to go somewhere where it will be enjoyed i'm not going to enjoy it and that's harsh um yeah. i do have models here which will always be here like many of you know that i'm a absolutely raving fan of the nano talent i think that's just an amazing model um and that specifically because you can point the noise you, a you can run lions in it it takes a good payload you and with even with its minor annoyances like the flat wing mold which you need to do in a couple of they put servos in the wing it's like still i mean like, I think I'm still pissed to this day with Zoe HD because why didn't they put servos in the wings? That stupid mechanism is <laughs> shite. There's no other words for it. Um, just put two servos in the wings and be goddamn done with it because you've got the connectors to do it and you've proven that you can do it in other models. So that 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 frustrated me. Anyway, coming back to the landscape, love it because you can just point it in north, just point it to the moon and stop when you should. Uh, so yeah. So what other, what other planes do you like? You got the Nano Talon. What what are you like your five favorites? Five favorites. I do not. I actually wrote those down um, in my notes before. So 
Um, I, I, you, need, you need to label this one correctly. I feel for value for money, this model cannot be touched by any other model ever created for FPV. Uh, and that is the XUAV Mini Talon. I have and will not come across another model for 40 quid, which yeah. flies that good and has that many mods and that following for it. It's absolutely amazing. So the, the thing is, is that I don't like have like one favorite. I have favorites for specific things. And for me, the Mini Talon is just amazing because it just covers the bases you can fly very far with it you can tree bash with it you can stick two carrots on it and put two motors on the front of it and fly it like an absolute tool um you can go tree hop hopping with it you can chase sheep around a field uh and it absolutely loves it up and you just stick another 50 it, it takes a 5200 4s you know like the industry standard of all batteries is that how good is a model does it take a 5200 4s uh, and you can fit two of them in that model and it still flies exactly the same. So that would be number one, XUAV Mini Talon, just because it's absolutely amazing. If you've never owned one, you should own one. There's just no excuse because uh, it's just such a good model. Uh, the other one is, it's actually two models because I've kind of fallen in love with one which, well, I don't like it because it cost me 170 quid. Uh, but it flies, wow, it flies really well. Uh, so on one hand, it's the uh, EF Extra, and that is an absolutely amazing model for 120 quid. I will always have an EF Extra here because it is just so much fun. The only bad thing which I can say about it is they chose some stupid prop size for it, and the props are really fragile. So I've snapped goodness knows how many props with it. But in the sky, I, I, it is absolutely amazing. On the flip side to that, the Horizon V900, which is that 180 quid, well, it cost me 180 quid. Uh, there you go. Can you see Mark with mini salad? <laughs> it's not here. Someone's lending it to him. They're, yeah. they're, they're amazing. They're, they're yeah. absolutely amazing. I, I, I can't sing their praises enough. So um, I have one I have one here. Uh, someone from Germany sent it over to me for uh, my INF tuning series. So, uh, it has already flown in the past, but it, uh, he said to me it it has uh, it flew very very badly uh, when he tried it. So it also had a very hard landing, and so he decided uh, he will send it over to me. Uh, I completely set it up from scratch. I changed the cabling a little bit and uh, I optimized the rate because it was really tail heavy. And um, with the 5200 battery, I have to push it all over into the nose, including the pan and tilt, to just get the CG on spot. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's, I'm still pretty uh, scared of it uh, to launch it because I. Yeah, the, the only thing you can screw out with Mini Talent on the launch, you give it full NACA, assuming you're using the, the standard Sunny Sky 22 16 1250 kV motor with an 8x6 on 4S. Um, the only thing which you can screw up with, with the mini sand, full knacker, and the hardest, flattest launch you can do. No elevation in that launch. That's the that, that is the one thing which is bad thing which you can say about a mini talent. If you stick any degree uh, of up in it on launch, it will catch you out because that wing needs speed to get it going. Because and then once it goes, it'll just fly at forty-five miles an hour continuously until it falls out of the sky because the battery's flat. Yeah. So that's the only that's the only bad thing about it. hard and flat throw. Can't get wrong. The pr the problem with that one is that uh, the motor shaft is actually slightly bent uh, because I got it with a broken prop from the last hard landing. So mm -hmm. uh, we have now ordered the uh, Sunny Sky, the pretty big one, uh, not the twenty two sixteen. Uh, oh, the nine hundred kV one. Uh, yeah, it is a two one thousand two hundred kV because so twenty eight twenty eight fourteen. Yeah, the twenty eight fourteen uh, sunny sky. Yeah, we ordered it. You're gonna have fun fitting that one. <laughs> <laughs> so this... and that is a massive motor because so... I got the the, the thingy fourteens, the nine eighty kVs, which came off the XUAV clouds. So, so this is the uh, stock mini Talon motor that comes with the uh, plug and play version. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also have another one here, a 2814, 
but it is a 1300 I don't know where I put it right now uh, it's it has a higher KV and I tried that one uh, but when I throttle up even with an uh, 8 inch propeller it was pulling around 50 amps uh, so I decided not to use that because uh, after a few seconds of full throttle uh, it was really hot already and I also want to uh, try my 10,000 uh, milliamp hour uh, lithium ion pack and mm -hmm. that should not go above 40 amps to uh, not damage the cells. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, yeah, the mini salad, I think what we're trying to summarize there is that you can chuck a wide variety of different components in it and powertrains and it will lap it up. Even if you want to use LiPo to Lions to lower KV to higher KV. In fact, actually, one thing which I actually, well, I'll actually say, those of you which have got a mini talon, fly it line of sight. You will be amazed how many pilots have never ever flown their mini talon line of sight in the sky. It actually flies really well. Be prepared to be surprised. It is line of sight is absolutely bonkers. It is. It's I, I yeah. Yeah, there's nothing you can say bad because every answer you'll come back with is, is that it was 40 quid, you know? So coming back, EF Extra B900, two mental models because they are both ridiculously fast. V900 is definitely faster by a country mile that you can hear it ripping through the sky. I need to get some video footage out for that one. Uh, the other two models are right wing models from Chris Click. The Hardcore 44, which I really need to get around repairing. I hit that tree so hard last time I flew it. <laughs> and I literally smashed the wingtip on it. It is an absolute mess. It's like that Tech Sumo, which I'd mentioned earlier. It has decimated the phone. I'm, I'm going to have to cut the end off and make a new wingtip to go on it. But the Hardcore 44, again, is just an amazing wing. It flies like it's on rails. And it takes a 5200 4S. So you can absolutely gun it. And you've got loads of flight time. And if you hit summer, it will rip whatever you hit a new one. Um, they're like, it'd be like the biggie, the big daddy track over there, I nicknamed that Gash. And the reason why I nickname it Gash, because if you put that, or when I put that through a hedge, is that it will rip a Gash in the hedge. It will go through and go out the other side because it's so big and it probably went in there so fast as well. So number three, Hardcore 44, I think absolutely amazing model. Uh, and the other one, which was the scariest, no, is it, it, was it the scariest? It was right up there from a misconfigured vector, which I launched the uh, XUAV clouds. And it, it, those of you which know what an XUAV clouds is, it's a 1.8 meter twin motor model. It's like a binary, but bigger and built better. Uh, and I, it cost me 140 quid. It take it taken, Something like two weeks to lamb, to build, to get ready. And then I did it because I, I had the um, elevator the wrong way round. Is that when it also leveled, it went up and did this bloody great big loop right in front of the trees. And I just missed the ground. It was scary. Um, but the other scariest maiden I've ever had for the most light was. Besides, a, I had a Mustang once, which was me and Warbirds didn't get on. Um, and that ended up in the ground. But uh, the other scariest mate that I ever had was the Mini Drac. Literally just came out. Um, and I had the rates up far too high for that one. But since then, absolutely loved it. The Mini, the, 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 the Mini Drac. I know, I know, I know, I know some people which have had it and just not enjoyed it and maybe felt it was overhyped for what it was. And Actually, I think it stood the test of time because there is nothing which really matches it in the sky. People have only copied it since. Uh, and again, it takes a 5200 4S. So loads of speed if you want it, loads of range if you want it. Um, and if you stick it in a hedge, it will make a hole in the hedge. And I, I got to fix mine because I did stick it in the hedge. I had an L, believe it or not, I had an L9R fail safe for me, no more than 50 meters away from me. I remember like Andy's face, Matt, Put the throttle down. My throttle is down. It's fell safe. Uh, and it's in the tree going, Wee! And you go, oh, shit. No. So, um, uh, yeah, the, the mini rack actually is a really, really great plane. I'm, I mean, it's 
for my uh, for my opinion, it's too expensive. That's that's just the only big downside I have at this point. I know there are uh, different opinions, the build quality and the foam and the stability and all that stuff. Uh, I have helped a friend uh, setting his up. He bought a used one. It was completely f set up uh, with flight controller altogether for 170 euros. It was a really great price. And uh, then we went down to uh, Austria, flying in the mountains and all that stuff. And he just brought it. He never made it yet. Uh, the configuration was a total mess. Nothing was working at all. So mm -hmm. I completely flashed the flight controller from scratch. Uh, took me 10 minutes to set everything up. We just throw it, launch it, and this thing was flying on rails. In stabilized mode, in manual mode, you had no difference. It was really, really impressive. The only point is, uh, it's not really a long-range plane. It's a speed cruiser. It's not efficient at all. So it needs a lot of power to stay stable in the air. Yeah, that, I think that's the, the only mod that, which I really did to mine was actually turn the motor mount round and push the motor right back out on its limit. Um, that did cut the noise. So one thing which I have noticed, uh, and it's a cultural difference, whereas, and I don't mean to sandbox any person but as a broadly speaking uh, perhaps in the UK we need to be a little bit more careful about noise for example because there's always somebody in the opposite field wanting to complain um, whereas in the US they really don't give two hoots and want the noise that they want NASCAR in the air and they want that <laughs> you watch the wing racing and it's every single one of them has got that motor rammed up in there they don't give two hoots about uh, prop noise uh, and they just don't care, and they are much, much noisier models. I, there's a, I remember watching a video of Chris Click smashing the mini drag around the sky. That thing was so ridiculously loud. And we were like, when we first got it, we were a little bit concerned about the noise. So we literally just turned the motor mount around and had the motor hanging out the back. And I, I've actually done it on the daddy drag. And we, all three of us, which have got the full size drags, we've all done exactly, this, except for Andy, who's printing one off ready for this weekend. We've all got the extended motor mounts to get the motors out just that little bit further um, and there's and there's two benefits a there's less prop noise and b your model flies faster because the props in cleaner air and it so yeah i think it was about a 10 mile an hour nine eight to ten mile an hour difference for uh, the same model with the same battery pack in it just on two different days both in very minor wind conditions. One was 101 miles an hour and the other one was 109, 110 miles an hour in a straight line. It, it yeah. yeah. So. so the same the same comes to the uh, Kaipirinia, uh, Kaipirinia 2. Uh, I have also an, a lone Kai P2 here. Uh, I also set up and tuned. It was already maidened and I just did the trim and all that stuff. But if the uh, folding prop is unfolded, it's actually at the, at the um, thickest part of the prop. It's just five millimeters away from the foam. It's yeah. so close and it's so loud when, when it's flying. Uh, but the problem on the Kaipi is uh, it's really, really sensitive to CG. If the CG is actually on spot, it's so twitchy on the pitch, it was very, very hard to fly. So I, it needs to be a little bit nose heavy. But if I move the, the, the motor further back now, I get the, uh, I got this issue back uh, with the 5200 4S. Mm. It's funny, it's funny you bring up that wing. Sorry, you, you were going to say something there, Steve. No, I'm, I'm going to just, I might you keep going. I'll go off topic if you guys keep going. <laughs> well, with the Cappy wing, that was that was an interesting, again, it's one of those nice situations to be in when it is that if you have the ability to buy any model you want, sometimes you make the point by not buying a model. And the Cappy was one of those. Um, the, the TBS, is it? TBS, it was the TBS one with the yellow wings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was that one. Uh, a, it was overpriced. B, it was overhyped. And C, all the video footage which they had for that was either first thing in the morning or late at night. Every single one for it, which came out for that model. And I wasn't following for it. Because first thing in the morning and late at night, you have super, you have no wind. Everything's gone. There's no thermal in it. You can't see how the model's going to react. Uh, and I actually chose not to go there. And the one that actually came up very short, very short while ago for 25 quid wasn't in the best conditions or anything like that. Actually, well, it's the, there was just absolutely nothing special about it. 
Um, but I have to maybe like an AR nine hundred, which ironically I bought twice. I've got it up there in a box, which I need to make. So what do you uh, say about the AR nine hundred? Yeah, the uh, recruit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or uh, yeah. So I, I you like it or? Before. Sorry, Bob. Do you like it or? Uh, I bought it. Saying something time. about it. Yeah, I bought it the first time, and I stuck a Sunny Sky X2216 1250 kV motor on it. It did a ton down the flight line. Absolutely loved it. Um, then I stuck a 9 nav in it, and then I took it out of what I felt it should have been. So I then kind of got a board on it, and then I gave it to Andy. And then Andy did the Bolton mod, which was cut the middle out of it so I can fit 50 4S in it. Uh, and <laughs> you can imagine an AR900 with a 5200 forest in it. You, you get bored of smashing it around the sky, you know, because you fly for so long. Um, so this time around, I'm not making the mistake. I'm putting no flight controller in it, and I'm just going to use it to smash holes in trees. Uh, and that, that's what I'm going to do with the AR900. I, I like the A900. It had issues when it was first released. Um, that is for sure. Uh, but after that, they kind of fixed them all. And it, like I said, I've bought a second one. I, I can't wait. I, I need some time to get around to make it, which so, won't be a particularly hard build. Sorry, go on. This is actually my third build I have. So uh, the first one was completely smashed down. And this is mm -hmm. my high performance build with the Racer Star uh, ARB motor on it and an 8x7 prop. That is a scary motor. Yeah. That is. <laughs> Steve that is what he's showing you right there, Matt, you got to try that. Steve flew it on 3S and he was so scared he put back the sunny sky. <laughs> yeah, I was shaking. My, my, my legs were shaking with that thing. <laughs> Carry on talking. I'm going to show you. I'm going to get the motor which I'm sticking on it. And I don't know how to oh. make it. <laughs> Yeah. How fast was that, Mark? Uh, with that motor, 185 kilometers per hour. Jeez. Insane. All right, so 115 miles an hour, just yeah, yeah, yeah. So the one yeah. I identified for it is a Cobra 281410 1700 uh, <laughs> kV motor. Oh, wow. that's, that's, <laughs> that, motor. That's a mini direct motor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By, by the way, I have also a friend who flies the Racer Star RB actually on a mini drag, and he still makes about 140 to 150 kilometers per hour. So that Air B is actually an 8S motor. You can go up to 8S with that thing. Yeah, in theory. But uh, if you are on 6S, it's also uh, already on its limit with a 7-inch prop on a quadcopter. Yeah. On, a, on a ring with a 7-inch and 6S, you might already burn it up. And I had, I had someone burning an Air B up. So yeah, you put that Air B on that plane. You might want to start with that, Matt. Put that Air B on a 6S. <laughs> it's going to be ah, so actually that, that actually raises a very interesting topic around batteries which is that i refuse to go over 4s and the reason why i go out of 4s is because remember i'm self-funded so right. that if i've got a model which takes a unique battery that is a serious issue um so i there are models here which which you definitely would benefit from going five or even six s for sure but i refuse to go i refuse to do that 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 was the, that's in fact that's the only limit i have and have had in this hobby as a whole is that i refuse to go with four s and i do feel that perhaps in some ways that has restrains me in um, things which I can do, which may be not true to like the name rag the nuts off. So I can't do go and do crazy speed runs and things like that. Um, and I, I've actually come to the conclusion I'm actually quite happy with that now. Um, but I, I won't go, I won't go over 4S. So like the DRAC, the big DRAC runs on 8S, which is two 4Ss. So I bought four, oh, okay. 5200 4S new packs and Hobby King a short while ago, specifically for that model. And once I'm, I can, I can use them in the big track, or I can use them in one of the other models which we mentioned. Because to me, the, the 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 definition of a good model, but maybe with the exception of the uh, uh, EF Extra, is the de facto standard. Is that can you fit a 5200 4S in it? And if the answer is yes, then it's probably got my attention um, because it means either decent amount of speed. 
uh, or a decent amount of flight time. Uh, Matt, I have I have a tip for you. Uh, when you when you set up your new, new AR ring for smashing fences and <laughs> that stuff, uh, yeah. have you already plans to uh, make some uh, rigid rigidity mods on yours? I think that would come. I hope so. I haven't looked at the wings and what they've done to it. So I'll do. I'll make my decision when I get there. But the two things I'll do: does the wing flap around? If the answer is yes, then I'll stick some carbon rods in it. I'll also be laminating the wing as well because it's black EPP and that doesn't rip very well. Because remember, we're dealing with bushes and tree blood. We'll, I'm going to hit stuff with yeah. it, so it's laminated. Um, and the one thing which I may or may not do, because the balsa which I have here is quite soft balsa, not hard, the hard balsa, uh, is that I may change out the elevons and make those um, balsa, or I might just laminate them twice because yeah. that will make them really strong. I can I can quickly show you what I actually did on mine. So on the elevons, I have put some uh, three by one millimeter carbon stripes just directly on the leading edge here. Uh, on the trading edge, nice. I, 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 glue, I glued it on uh, with uh, UU pore or with Gorilla Glue, and then just put some lamb over there. And if you see here, if I move here, yeah, 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 I got there's you. no I... flex at all at this point. And yes. uh, to reduce the uh, flex of the ring tips, I can hold my whole the whole ring here. You see, there's not much flex uh, left so i put uh, another five by or one millimeter stripe carbon spar or carbon stripe just in this area yeah I, I remember when i first got the ar wing when it first came out and you if you'd done that on that wing tip it would have just bent over the whole wing would have just yeah. bent over and gone yeah. floppy sausage it yeah. was, it was and, that bad but they did improve it so you've got to give them their shoes and the third thing and i think that's the most important thing is i have uh, used another five millimeter wide carbon stripe i cut directly into the leading edge of the ring so here's mm -hmm. actually a carbon stripe directly flat injected and then i uh, laminated it first with fiberglass tape and then another uh, layer of laminate over it so i had a i had a wing tip crash so it really literally crashed this way into the ground with about around 100 kilometers per hour the only thing i had was a broken off camera mount uh, yeah, a crack in the fuselage down here no, uh, no up here a little crack and uh, both ring tips uh, were ripped off because the just the glue of the wood uh, wooden parts uh, went apart but no big damage at all mm -hmm. so it's it's a re really a tank it i think uh, if you hit a branch with that the branch won't survive <laughs> yeah so matt the, the, shank question, timber in the, background. <laughs> the question i have for you it was like a couple of years ago no it was about a year and a half ago i'd say you had a video out and you were showing like hey nothing's really come out in this hobby and there's no new planes out and you were talking about how Hobby King hasn't put out anything and all these other. But um, what I've been noticing is that uh, actually someone was confirmed. We've had uh, some conversations with somebody in the industry and they confirmed one thing which I thought all along, which is that what most of the stuff we get is from China. And mm -hmm. there's a certain size box it has to fit into. And if it gets over the size box, the price escalates by double. So one of the things like when Mark, you were talking about this is not worth the money or this is worth the money and things like that, a lot of that what you're paying for is shipping. It's not going to the manufacturer if they go after a certain size. But what I've noticed is that, you know, being honest here, is that we get these planes, a lot of times you get these kits, and sometimes I don't really think the people who build them and uh, know what they're doing like they they kind of like they got a design from someone else and they kind of put it together and the cg marks are wrong and the 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 components are absolute crap and so it's a good plane but it, it takes some expertise to explain to someone this is what you need to do with it yeah it's, uh, I, yeah i i i think you're absolutely right and i've just seen your marker on there as well we, yeah. we are quite far into this chit chat so if you're still here you're hardcore yeah. You're a hardcore, yeah. Thank you. You you really are. Um, so yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And we have seen this time and time and time again where kits have turned up and they never tested that themselves. 
there's yeah. no way in a blue monkeys you actually went you actually flew the model for one and actually put it together because if you'd put it together you would have spotted this um even a novice would just spot it um and also just parts being missing from a kit um point blank you're just useless in short um but it may, may some, some, sometimes that's the fun of it, isn't it? There, there, there are different genres of pilot, aren't there? There's people who like to build models and may never even fly them. I, I know multiple people like that um, who just like the look of the models. You have people like me, which really don't care and just want to smash it around the sky. That's me. Uh, and you have any like the people who will mod a model. Um, I think that maybe that that's the little in, ingrained piece in Mr. Newen is that uh, he uh, and I love how so tactful he is. I I I, I just can't do it. It's not in me to be tactful. Yeah. Um, which is that you you will have that to the flight line within four hours and have some first impressions, um, and then he might make a point that the box flies bottom better than the model which was in the box. That's always a. a, a <laughs> Uh, or you have the the, the mods um, one, which comes out afterwards. Or you just get that mutant, uh, that Tundra mutant, which he made, which had the wings off one model, which was terrible by itself. And then he made his own bit of a fuselage and the tail off something else. And he made this Tundra, which he, he didn't want to buy a Tundra, but he liked the idea of it, this bush plane, and he went on and built it. So, yes, Steve, it, it is glaringly apparent that there are manufacturers out there who don't actually put their models together. Um, there are some be better ones. Hobby King, most mod Hobby King models are pretty good. Um, although anybody will have a moan about, I think, about, about them, to be honest. Um, whether it's fair or not is a different question um, or a whole different topic. Um, yeah, as much as I, I think we will pick on Zo HD as a really positive example, as much as I think the that dart, whatever it was, it was an absolute flying turd. Do you know I gave that model away for free and the bloke which I gave it to still doesn't like it. He don't know even what to do with it. It, it just doesn't fly straight. It was a shit model out of the box and it's still a crap model. The and they're supposed to be written out of V2, which I don't think, <laughs> I don't think you can improve it, but yeah. they, they might do. Um, but they've come out of a collection of models. I've got, a, Mark Yearly, you mentioned about your 250G. I've got one of those on the way to me. Yeah. At this yeah. Moment. So I've seen a couple of videos. It looks really good. My circumstances could be very interesting because it does fly fast. You travel grounds very, very quickly and you can get a sensible amount of kit in there as well. Yeah, I mean, the 250G has actually more space than the uh, Drift has in there for a flight controller and battery. Yeah, and I saw stuff. that. It looks amazing. Yeah. How much room? I've just come from trying to cram I know in that tiny little hole. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be roomy. It's going to be like a I mean, bedroom apartment. I mean, I mean, uh, the only pain in the ass on the 250G is to put the GPS in the position where it is supposed to be, uh, because there is uh, behind the air inlet that's on top of the plane that cools the ESC. Behind this inlet, there is a canopy on top. And if you try to squish the GPS in there with this sticky foam pad on top, you will it, it will stick everywhere but in this hole where it's supposed to be. <laughs> so at, at the end, after I was able to put it in there, uh, after every flight I looked at it, it was fa it has fallen down. For every time it falls down, it just doesn't stick to that foam. So it, in the end, what I did, <laughs> I uh, took a little needle, I put a hole on top, just squeeze some uhu pore in there and then press the GPS in there and now it's glued it's in stuck. completely. I, I don't think I'll be that graceful. I think I'll just put a carving knife in the top and then just <laughs> glue it the top and then glue it in. Uh, I, I, that might sound brutal, but then I always know it's there. It hasn't fallen down and it's, it is one of those key components which will get you home. So yeah, I think I might just put the craft knife in it and hot glue it in. Yep. Harsh, but true. You need to be, by the way, you need to be very careful. If you uh, put INAV in there, uh, the default mixer for a Delta ring is 50-50 mixer for uh, for elevator and uh, aileron. So uh, Mark has a whole write-up on that on INAVFixedWingGroup.com. Yeah, the uh, throw for pitch is just too low. 
you you will barely be able to pull up out of a dive with the default mixer so uh, i've with the with, with the stock servos if you use other servos maybe then it will work but if you use the pnp version so i found the sweet spot sweet spot at about 65 percent for pitch and mm -hmm. uh, if you build it uh, nose heavy like with a 3s lithium ion or a bigger 3s battery in the nose uh, then you go uh, can go up to 70. if you go too high it will start to um and you give it a full uh, awesome. full, full elevator up then it yeah. will start to dolphin around the loop you will so. recognize that so it's just speed stalls but it's very yeah, I, very delicate delicate yeah it, it it's of a similar format to a, to a drac and i i have been burned by the one of the scariest maidens which i was mentioning earlier <laughs> um so i'm very aware of pitch and uh, roll uh in that format of a model um because you need the extra pitch in it <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and you don't need very much roll at all but then it's not meant to be a mental aircraft it's not i'm i want it because of speed and the ground which it will cover um and the way which i can load it up with lions so really looking forward to that one apparently it's being shipped tomorrow i checked banggood this morning um i do have a uh what should we call it sonic model which is also zo hd i don't know if you know that it's the same company yeah, just yeah, yeah. brands um is that i've got the binary on the way to me and it's because i don't want to buy the older bird and remember the binary is a thin wing yeah, yeah. The, the the binary is 80 quid the fin wing is 80 dollars but by the time you add shipping it turns into 126 dollars and that bites a bit um so i went with the binary instead and i know that's got a collection of mods which need to, to be made to it so I got that one on the way to me shortly, which I'm looking forward to. That's Tuesday. I think that turns up here. Yeah. It kind of brings up a good point, which is like that's a great company, Finwing, but they don't sell really anywhere else but on their website. So they have some fantastic models. But that's what I was hoping to do in the group. Like you know, like twice a year, we get people in, in the country. Like, okay, I want to put my Finwing order together. If you guys live close enough together, you can break it down. You know, we could build buy three models and split shipping. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it was to go back to your thing about the the unit sizes. Um, yeah. Is that that's a, that's another part which I've had quite a lot of experience with, which is the importing of products into different countries and different circumstances. Uh, and there there is that threshold of where you can get it into air freight or not, because that's basically when you buy some online, if it, uh, especially now with Amazon, especially here in the UK, it's I know it's a little bit different in the US. Two day shipping is quite nice, and that's yeah. fast for the US. Um, well, to be brutally honest, if it's not here the same day, it's late. That that's <laughs> my, that is the consumer standard here in the UK because you can buy it on Amazon and it'll be with you, but like before eleven o'clock, and it'll be with you by nine o'clock in the evening. Um, and yeah, that, that's a much thing. smaller country, yeah. Yeah. Whereas you're you're a little bit maybe a little bit more forgiving from China. Yeah. You think that's really far away, but actually China owns airlines, and that's the government ships products into Germany and a couple of other hubs just to get their stuff out as fast as possible. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, the, the whole logistics thing is absolutely crazy. And unfortunately, we're, we're still getting, just with the circumstances which we're in, the, one of the side effects from the pandemic is that there are boats just, they're going around the world, but with not anything on them because it all got delayed so when things get back to normal right. even by say september ish right. is it's still going to be an absolute mess for heavier and bulkier products so like maybe like companies like hobby king for example they're probably really feeling it in their warehouses oh yeah they can't get the stuff in and the stuff which does leave is taking longer it's getting stuck in ports because they don't have the staff there. Um, so it will be when things like get, it, it's all going to be like six, eight weeks longer because of that massive delay which goes through. Um, sorry, I went off topic there with, with the shipping side, but that, yeah, that pandemic has caused a large number of issues. But um, coming back to the point is that, yeah, you buy something on Banggood or another Chinese site, eight, nine days. It's pretty damn good to be honest that's a very very long distance for a model to travel uh, an object to travel um and the couriers are getting back to normal i think every single order which i've had 
from being Marx's shipped on Banggood has been here in eight days, which I think is pretty. It's, it's insane. That's great. It's insane. And, and, and it's really bad because I feel really bad because I've seen so many people's comments going, I've had stuff stuck in customs for like two months now yeah, because yeah, they bought it in March. Coming. And yeah. I've come in late now, in the, only in the last couple of weeks, started buying stuff, and it all just keeps turning up. And I feel really bad. I feel like bad for Sam. Um, she, she, she's as bad as me. I'm sure it's the same as you guys. You've got a new model on the way to you, and you keep pressing the bloody refresh button on the track. It's like, oh, fucking load of whatever. Because <laughs> um, that's the 12-year-old out for three quarters. Like, I want it now. I want to make it. Um, so, yeah, that poor, my herpes lady who turned up and delivered the... the that model, that drift on that Saturday morning, I, I think I scared her a bit, um, but I was just super happy that it turned up because I wasn't expecting it to the Monday. So to, to get that one for the Saturday was happy days. Fantastic. Yeah. Was that enough yeah. topic for you? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, we, we've got uh, you know, issues here. I mean, this is a much different hobby than it was a few years ago. I mean, a few years ago, Hobby King was completely loaded and with everything you would ever need and it was three days so you order on sunday it'll be here tuesday mm -hmm. it was just and it's not that way anymore and so now one of the things that we're looking at is we've got a hobby where we get a plane especially here in the united states it shows up in two months if you break it it's another two months before it shows up again or longer depending on what it is mm -hmm. so what we're trying to do is with this group is we're trying to like have Mark go through and take these planes. That's why he's asking for planes from people and we're getting planes sent to us. And um, we're trying to get the best possible setup we possibly can for these planes so that explain to people how you put it together mm -hmm. so that you can have a good experience with your INAV plane because this might be your first plane and it might be your only INAV plane for, you know, until next flying season. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. I understand. I understand that for sure. <laughs> I mean, it, if if you are if you are very experienced pilots with five, six, seven, twenty planes around you, then it doesn't matter if you crash one, you take another one, and you uh, can get your time to the new frame or whatever arrives, or the spare parts. But if you are just beginning with the hobby, you have your first plane, you just build it up, you finished right. everything. And then you crash it and your ring broke off or whatever and that's really a nightmare and that can completely get you out of the hobby again i i totally understand that and the reason why i totally understand that is that i had two influences me from for me very early on the first one was sir bruce um who has never really had a high opinion of hobby king at all um and also the axn floater jet which i for my first model the esc which they had in it was absolute junk so I went round. By the time I'd put up and ailerons in it, it just fell at falling out of the sky. It just lost control. If you used more than three servos at the same time, oh god, the the, the bet crapped out on it. And I was going, no. I, I even then I knew that I know I'd put the right stick commands in because I'd watched enough videos, uh, and it still misbehaved. Um, so that was a very frustrating. I think they paid badly for that for for a long period of time. Um, from that first beginning experience, which should not have been negative, and it was shite components which they put in the model. But um, no, I like that idea, and I also like the idea of having PIDs available, suggested PIDs right. um, for different models. I think that's extremely useful. Um, I got the PIDs out of um, Keith Bonafide Pirate uh, for his Dart 250G. I've got those on my messenger, which I can use. Well, actually, I've even got, even got a screenshot off my phone from which he did on one of his videos, which I've got available, um, which I was watching. So yeah, having a suggested pits for different models. I think that's maybe that's one thing we'd all like to see in lineup, isn't it? A much wider selection of models. Uh, the two things I love about you is that uh, the first one is you fly in horizon mode, and you love horizon mode, and I love horizon. Mode. <laughs> Jen, just give me one minute. I, I unfortunately I need the little boys' room, but the toilet's just over there, so I'm gonna be back in one second. So talk all right. amongst yourself. Okay. Be back there. <laughs> okay. Talk amongst yourself, girls. Let's go. All right. So. <clears throat> yeah. Um. I think I'm not <coughs> sorry. I'm not sure right now, but uh, I think Bonafide Pirate actually started his 250 50G with my pits, uh, and maybe have has just uh, retuned a little bit. So it could even be that <laughs> he has used my pit as a base. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love it. So, uh, do you have any more planes that you're going to be putting pits out for in the near future? Or yeah, no, right now I. 
right now I'm uh, working with the with the drift, so I will see that I get the uh, flight controller in there till tomorrow, and okay. uh, get everything set up. Uh, I, need I know to... we have that project we're working on, so that's kind of that. That's the next we... one, yeah. Potentially, we might have another episode next Sunday, um, depending how things go. And yeah. if not next Sunday, it will be the following Sunday. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the, the drift will be the next project, and we will put it on the website too, of course, if the setup is finished. And okay, perfect. Uh, then I'll see. I'm not sure right now about the Kaipi and the uh, Mini Talon because uh, we should stay with beginner's planes. But yeah, we will see how it goes and uh, how I find the time to tune both planes. Yeah, so I was saying you love the horizon mode. No, the yeah. Thing, in, so uh, we're, the, we're the minority here, I guess. Uh, these two guys hate it. <laughs> and uh, the other thing I love about you is you're not willing to... You'll take a plane and crash it. Like, I remember looking at the Bixler. You had a brand new to start the video. And by the time the video was over, the thing was, like, uglier than <clears throat> my Bixler that I've crashed, like, ten times over the last three years. I just don't. I, so the Bixler is Andy's fault because every year he buys a new one, and there was like a video of him just flinging the carcass across the flight line. And that is the thing about the Bixler is that I, if it lasted the day, I was happy, and, and that was just my whole point with it. I just did that model, I just did not care. And sometimes it's nice to have a model like that, which you just do not care and you fly like an absolute tool and <laughs> that is the that is the Bixler um, and I'll let you into a little secret I have it you'll be seeing it flying on Sunday but in the wrong direction because I've glued the wings on backwards so, <laughs> <laughs> I, if, if it flies it flies you know um, if not it's going to get a rocket up its chuffer and we'll blow it up um, so we're winners all round but um we are. I think there's a there's a whole collection of us which are already disappointed that you can't get a Hobby King Bixler two uh, for love nor money at the moment because it's full flying season uh, and we need at least three of them amongst us already because I want another one because it was just so much fun. They came available the other day and I ordered one. I did. Yeah, and I ordered the wings. So I had the fuselage already, so I've got. I'm all set up for that thing. That's just a great plane. So yeah, they're here in the states, but I'm, by now they're probably sold out again. Because the back order. I, I, I'm checking here right now because I've got to have a look. Because if there is one, I'll go and get one ordered. Because there was just it was just such a stupid model just to muck around with. This, this and that was when, when they went in the sky. That that was it. There was there was no there's no rules. It's just but uh, the point I was trying to make though is that you're you love the crap builds where you can take um you could take a plane and you can just start putting in a flight controller. You put those little omnibus flight controllers in. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, yeah, there's another thing. I mean, these guys are dropping, and Mark hates the bus flight controllers. But I, the idea is that you can take for like fifty dollars, you can throw iNav into a plane, and you can get it going. And so you, you take some of your old planes. Yeah, uh, the funny thing is, you could even get a iNav flight controller for twenty euros or so, or twenty dollars or whatever. Uh, but uh, then you would go into an like omnibus F four, and I hate these flight controllers. I hate these oh. so much, and I never used one for myself. But... I got F four <laughs> in my drift, and I, I think it's the best thing ever. I, I just, yeah. it, it works, you know. An omnibus F four. I think it is. F4 V3, right? That's what yeah. I flashed it with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. They're, they're... If you don't know what the board is, you just flash it with Omnibus Board Pro, uh, <laughs> Omnibus board Pro and it works. Yeah, they're... These are like the... you flash it with Omnibus. There are, a lot, there are a lot of clones, like the HDLRC uh, F4 flame boards uh, I use in my uh, old Freestyle Quad uh, are also using the Omnibus target because they, they are clones. But the original genuine Omnibus boards are so crappy. Uh, they Their BCs blow up like... I don't well, that's know. the thing about the omnibus boards. You never you buy one that has the BEC or, or the uh, PDB built into it because they're garbage. You have to buy the Maytech 6S PDB and they use like an F4 V3 and you have to put a bunch of different filters on there because they're noisy as hell. But by the time you put it together, you got like $25 in the flight controller, but it's rock solid. So 
you know, it, they work. And then there's there's guys driving in the group that are flying the uh, binary around, you know, like 20 miles out with these things. I'm like, you're crazy. You got like a $15 flight controller into this plane. That's yeah, that, that's the interesting thing is as well. I, that I, I, I've not seen it firsthand, thankfully, but I, I know that it goes on is that somebody will load up a model, they will get it trimmed in, and then they're gone. Yeah. And they're gone far. I, 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 I just don't. You see me smash the living day lights out of a Bixler. And unfortunately, the Hobby King UK site don't have any in the UK or EU. Because um, I would literally would go and buy another one um, today if they had it. Yeah, but, it's a um, great plan. But the, the it, it, yeah, for me, it's always baby steps. You, with each flight, you learn something new. You learn how a model reacts. And especially if it's new, so with the drift, for example, that that has all been baby steps up to that waypoint mission, which was that I was just making sure everything it reacts the way it should be and things like that. Like we read that chat back to Failsafe at the beginning uh, as well. And it's just you need to identify those things in a safer, closer environment um uh, before you go and send it 20 miles you know because they will send it you look on youtube and they're going there was a video for some bloke doing i don't know if it was miles or kilometers but it was 20 miles or 20 kilometers in that dark 250g just in a straight line he just went <laughs> out it's it, 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 all right done 20 so that, that's what mark that. does yeah <laughs> yeah okay I, I didn't i didn't rent out uh, 20 kilometers my my furthest away with the 250g was uh, 13 kilometers uh, yet because i had problems with the uh, vtx antennas i needed to find a very long one because this 250g has so much carbon in there uh, there's carbon in each ring uh, on the on the uh, elevons uh, the carbon spar then you have the motor on the back you have the battery in the front so no matter in what direction your plane is looking if you are high up you will already have something in the way of the signal so I needed a very very long antenna so I built my own one now that's about 17 or 18 cent centimeters long so it's very high up to get a long range the way forwards yeah uh, yeah you know I have a 600 milliwatt uh, VTX in there with a 500 milliwatt uh, Matek VTX for example I went out 15 kilometers with no issues on the AR ring but on the Dart 250G with the uh, with, this, with the same antenna uh, the build, uh, the the video was gone at 6 kilometers wow but but then uh, with the longer antenna now I double the range with, with these because if, if i was banking in some direction uh, so the antenna had i had a f uh, free line of sight to the uh, between the antenna and my uh, receiver the picture was great again and as soon as the plane levels out snow only snow on the screen <laughs> it's funny you say that i got so many comments a couple of days ago but i got a little z84 here with a Maytag b antenna in it on the 1.3 kit Mm -hmm. I said, you got it the wrong way round. I said, no, I haven't. I've got it exactly the right, 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 right way round because I want a beautiful picture on the way back. And if I'm coming home, well, I'm not that bothered because I'm coming home and that's what Return to Rome's for if I can't see where I'm going. Uh, I thought that would, yeah. Yeah, let, let, yeah, let me show my, my antenna setup I have right now. Go for it. Oh, uh, while Mark's grabbing his model, one thing which I actually have been really impressed with is that I've always used circular polarized antennas. Yeah. Uh, and that they, they, if you're flying in and around shrubbery, trees, or low, then uh, then a clover style antenna where you're on 5.8 or another frequency is absolutely fantastic to catch the multipath in. However, if you're just out in clean air, a dipole is insanely good. The video quality is better with a dipole um, if you've got clear, if you've got nothing, if you're not bouncing off anything. Um, I think that's maybe that's one thing which I've actually ironically learned. Mm. More recently, the dipole, but I, I I always thought they were crap. No, actually, they're really good yeah, in the right circumstances. That's true, but uh, for long range stuff, I use a, usually use a, a very high gain direction antenna. So I need to get a Yagi antenna. I need to get an, a new mount for my antenna tracker and all that stuff. So I decided to stay with Omnis for now. And yeah. uh, that's actually my antenna setup right now. So this is this uh, Emax uh, nano, v uh, nano antenna. Uh, it's usually just that long. So mm -hmm. in the beginning, it was at this point here. 
So if I fly away from me, the motor is disturbing the signal. If I fly sideways, these carbon parts and the carbon spar will uh, block my signal. And if I come back, the video is completely gone until I was at a two kilometer range. And now I just used an old um, MMCX to SMA pigtail, a very stiff one. Uh, mm. Just cut it in half, soldered it together with the antenna. And now I have a very nice and high uh antenna that should work better hopefully an interesting thing there is actually a design which has been carried over by both by the 250g dot and also here on the drift is those rods and the control horn in those elevon surfaces there is no way in a blue monkey is that you are going to pull that out yeah are you because yeah. they they you had to they had to go down through the surface it's they're, they're, they're not coming undone. I actually I think that's a really, really nice design feature. I'm not sure right now if the actual servo horns or the, the aileron horns are from carbon too. No, these are plastic. But mm -hmm. these carbon spars are pushed through the rings mm. and then uh, glued in there. So there's no chance you rip them out ever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I, I really do like that. I did spot that on the drift and I was like, I like that. It's, it works it's, really well on the Nano Goblin. It's, it's still that, flexing. That, that, that with carbon fiber control horns, so it works really well because it distributes the force across the the control surface as well. Yes. Mm. So it's still flexing here at the end because it's not uh, very centered, but uh, these servos have a pretty high torque, so it's uh, it's pretty mu pretty uh, strong force I have to apply here to flex that way. Uh, but mm. as the plane is very light, anyways, that doesn't matter. That flex. Yeah, yeah, that, that's going to be, yeah, in larger models or super high speed, that that would be a concern, but yeah. that's going to be fine. Fantastic. Well, I'm saying now that we've got, um, we should just get close to wrapping up, I mm. just want to ask you, Matt, you are back, and what's the future hold for you as far as, you know, what you're doing as far as videos and just what you feel like? Or that, That's a really good question. Um, the honest answer to that is that I have absolutely no plans uh, at all. Um, I, I hate video editing exactly the same amount as I did before. I, I it just I just don't like editing videos. Don't get me wrong; it's a chore, it's a necessary evil to creating content, and perhaps that's why I have always tried to create as much live content as possible because that's no editing. I love it. Um, and I can hold my own in a live environment, um, which is a skill which I had a bit before, and I've definitely honed that one down now. Um, so future, I have no definitive plans. I, uh, I know that, that's a good thing because that's not, that's not yes or no at all. I'm just seeing what happens. I've got a, a collection of videos. I'd like to get that video out on the on OTG cable and the speed. Speedy B app, I think that's really cool. I that that me basically you don't have to take a laptop to the flight line. I think I, I was very excited when I recorded that video. I've got a collection of other things which I'd like to get out. I have created so for every video which you have seen in the last two weeks, I've created that and more. I have become quite particular on what I'm producing. Um, the, the the thing is is that I I knew before. And I know it is ultra clear what separates what I did previously and what would be needed to be really successful with YouTube. And I have some free time coming up. Like I was saying earlier, one of the businesses we, which we're, we're in the process of wrapping up, which is a bit shit, but um, it needed to get done. Um, so I. I don't know. It's the honest answer. I, I genuinely don't know. It, it could go either way, and it may not be within RC as well. That, that's the mm, brutal reality. Um, and that's nothing. It it might just be audience related, um, as in the within the us. It, put it this way: if you if you're gonna if you're gonna go and dedicate a hundred hours a week, because I am very much a kind of like. But the, the terms balls deep is that you're either in it, you're not. And if I decide that I'm not going to do something, then I'm just not going to do it. And there's enough 
it is what it is. You know, you, 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 you're only going to do, as far as I'm concerned, you're, only, you're going to do something to your best of your abilities or not. Um, and I don't, and I, I just genuinely don't know. I, I'm, at, I'm at a crossroads with a collection of different things at the moment. Um, I'm personally much happier than what I was before. Um, <laughs> yeah, life's good at the moment, you know. Um, we got this terrible, terrible, stupid, frustrating time almost under our belts. It's almost over and done with. Um, and that's almost out of the way. And I don't know. I, there, there are other topics which could be personally exciting for me to do. Whether I do them or not, I don't know. Um, but the main thing is, is that I absolutely love flying models around. That's the one thing which I can say. So let's leave this on. I, I, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And you, as you might be able to tell, I, I can't give you an answer because I haven't worked it out in my head um, what I want to do and when I want to do it and how long for. Because those are really serious questions. If, you, if you're going to throw yourself in for a lot of hours and you've got to remember before is that that was a sh lot of content being created. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I generally know, watch the space, what happens happens. But the main thing is I had that, that 12 and three quarter year old is in me every time I fly a model. Um, and it doesn't mean it doesn't need to, I can see Darren smiling there because he knows exactly what we're talking about. Yep. <laughs> you, you can be, it's still there. So I very much like the hobby as a whole. I don't think it, that will always be with me, whether that includes me creating content on YouTube. I genuinely don't know. I, I just don't know. So yeah, I think that. Be, take your passion and do what you want. Don't give yourself such big goals where you feel like you're trapped into like having to put out content all the time because that'll just make you miserable. But you know, it's just great to have you. Even if you come out like once a month with a video, it's like, yeah, we'll watch it. And that's kind of, and that's kind of what the hobby's about. We're all like, everybody has whatever time you can put into it. We we mm. put it to it, and some of us have more time than others. So. But it's great to have you back, and you know it really does mean a lot. I'm hoping that in the uh, future here we can get you back on again, so we can talk about other stuff. Because this has been an absolute pleasure to have you on here, and I love this whole no topic thing. It's just questions as they come up, and just chatting and let things flow. It, it has been very, very curious, and I am humbled again by thank you for, for inviting me on. I, I genuinely really do appreciate that. And, I, and I'm still humbled, going back to what I said at the very, very beginning, I'm still very humbled by the very nice comments and the the, the, the very warmness which was there when that video popped up of Josh scratching his back with a toy on it because <laughs> did stuck it in the back. I lost so many subscribers that day and I just don't care. Because it, it absolutely wet my pants. Because Andy had stuck that toy arm in his car, uh, in his van, and that that was that was funny. So, um, yeah, I think that was actually um, Josh. Yeah, when did I get back to making videos? Yeah, it was Josh's fault, I think, because that actually made me laugh my head off. Because I found it so funny. So yeah, the point which I was trying to make was thank you. The, that's the two words which I was trying to say. It's great to have you in the group, and we've definitely enjoyed having you on the chat and. Um, whatever you feel like doing for the hobby, we absolutely appreciate it. So thank you for what you've done for the hobby. I mean, really, you're the person, like the first one, right? What's this INAV thing? I, I, I went to you. So that was it. But your video started from there. So and you've helped me out so many times that you, you, you don't even know. So I'm glad thanks. to hear it. And I, just going back, to, we, we covered that topic earlier, didn't we? Is that if you make a video which is, it solves your own problems, then it will be an interest to somebody else. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that's that, that, that's a, a soldering the S bus port on the F four V three. That was like nobody, nobody explained that. There's no documentation of that anywhere. Yeah, I find that out from via so much frustration. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So. Fantastic. Well, that's it for us. Thank you so much for Darren Lines, Mark Hoffman, and Matt. We thank you. And please join us again next week for more exciting stuff or the week after whenever we do this next one. Take care, everybody. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Stream stopped.